again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. Today on the program, Fran Drasher to bitch about things. Plus, <laughs> Tony Khan may be the world's most beloved billionaire, but I'm the world's most popular podcaster. And they've shot William Shatner into space, and I've got a few suggestions on who might be next. But to join me in this, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he likes to go where no podcast has gone before, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. I have been highly caffeinated this morning, and I'm looking for more, and I'm excited about this show. Highly caffeinated? Oh, yeah. You're on the caffeine, huh? That's... That's what your problem is. So I quit that. That's been 30 years ago. Jim Hurd, the only good thing he ever did for me was got me off caffeine when it hospitalized me for all the stress I had to put up with under that coon-headed moron. But anyway, <laughs> speaking of being shot into space, I, I had a little extra space travel. To, I, had, I was out in the fresh air this week. Let me tell you what happened. So, you know, it's been now, we've, we've announced the, the opening and closing of the Cornette's Collectibles store at jimcornette.com. All the orders came in. We've been giving everybody the updates. Well, over the last week, I've been a busy bee since we've spoken. It's been a while. And I started in on, I got all the orders sorted out. T-shirts, DVDs, books, pictures, figures, mixed items. It's all sorted got several hundred labels all done up and started in on the on the uh, on the pile got into the order mine this week cuz I want to start getting these things out to the customers everybody's waiting for the updates and so since I was doing it, I figure I'm going to start I'm going to break myself in get myself back in a swing of things there were about 200 people that just ordered an autographed picture or a cult cornet membership certificate which is slides easily into a stay flat cardboard mailer, no box assembly, no packing peanuts involved, not, you know, a ton of it's just boom. It's right there. I can get that done. I'm going to knock those out. So I get all these uh, autograph pictures and membership certificates all done up. I've got them all, all laid out and then all done up in the packages. And I'm starting to lay out some behind the curtain graphic novels that go in the same cardboard mailers. I've got a, assembly line going here this past week and and stace had said that uh since you're doing all that I, she went to visit our friends out near lexington where she takes harley and they got the dogs and they run the dogs and they have the the wine drinking and the girls nights and all these type of things and lee uh, she said i'll leave you to do all of this because i'm not going to get a chance to see them and i should mention that stace going back to california next week we had said here on a show back in august that her mom had had a heart procedure done now she's actually going to have to have heart surgery and so we want to wish her well on that and that's going to take place the end of well, when does this come out i'm lost in a in a fog here but it's going to happen in a little over well about a week from now as we're recording this so anyway good luck on that but stace has to go back out of california she's going to be out there for a little while she ain't going to get a chance to go visit out there okay go take harley go run the dogs i'm gonna i'm gonna just be a killer on these things and i'm gonna ship thursday and friday morning i'm gonna get a couple of hundred things out of the way each day so thursday morning bright and early bright it was a beautiful day here beautiful weather sun shining and the, the temperature was nice and as i go out to the post office i'm gonna meet the lovely and talented brie at 9 a.m and the guy's already here mowing the yard. And he's on the lawnmower. You got the smell of the fresh cut grass. And I get in the truck, old black beauty, and I turn it on. And the one thing is, it's it's first thing in the morning, and I don't have room to put the truck in the garage anymore. Uh, so it's been sitting out in the driveway. And the winds, windows are foggy. And I turn the windshield wipers on and clear that off. But my one, my side window has got the fog on it, Brian. And being a lazy man... I don't get out and go around with a towel and wipe it off. I'm going to roll the window down, roll it back up, and that's going to take care of the fog. That's what everyone does. Who gets out of the car and wipes off the other window? Well, you know, it it's, would be the prudent thing to do just because of what I'm about to tell you, but I didn't, I didn't feel the need to, to do that at this particular point in time. 
I roll the window down and then I start rolling it back up. And as it goes almost all the way up, I hear crack and it stops. And I'm like, what the, what the fuck? And then I try to fucking fiddle it with the button again. And it drops by itself halfway down into the door. I'm like, oh, God damn it. Now I get out and I go around there, which I should have just done to begin with. And I'm trying to push the window up with my hands because the, the, the thing is broke. The power lifter thingy. Rock auto. We'll talk about them later. But anyway, so I can't, because it's wet and it's foggy, I can't push the goddamn window up. So I call one of the yard tards. I said, hey, hey, come here, help me, help me. So he gets off the lawnmower. And he comes and we get the hands on either side of it and push it back up, right? And I'm thinking, all right, all I got to do is go to the post office. I'll just, I'll deal with this later on. I'm going to get these pictures shipped. My first big shipping day back in action. At least the window's up. Nobody's going to know that it's broken. I pull out of the driveway. I turn left. And the first bump I hit, the fucking thing dropped all the way down. Just like a rock. What the fuck? Now I'm, I'm, there's no way to grip any part of the window now without taking the door apart. So I'm, yeah, I'll go get this shipped and then I will figure out who's going to fix this window. So I'm going through the subdivision and Brian, as I mentioned, it was a lovely, beautiful morning. The wind blowing through my hair, just, just enjoying the fresh air, whether I liked it or not. I get to the post office. There's only like three cars there. I'm perfect. There's not even a crowd. I get out. I think it's my little neighborhood here. It's broad daylight. I could probably leave all four doors standing open and it, all my shit would still be in the truck. When I came back, I've got nothing in there to steal because I'm taking the merchandise in. I'm good. I'll leave the window down. Weather's beautiful. I pull all the stuff out of the back of the truck. I put it on the dolly and suddenly I hear a voice. Jim, Jim, Jim. I look up. It's Bree standing in front of the front door, waving like Jim Ross was in front of Bill Watts's Rolls Royce that night in Tulsa when I was running and the people were throwing the bottles. He's like, stay away from the car. She's going, no, no. I'm like, What's the matter? Now we're yelling across the parking lot. Their internet was down at the post office. They couldn't take credit cards. They couldn't take debit cards. They couldn't do international. They couldn't do anything that required it. She said, do you have your checkbook? I'm like, no. And then I'm standing beside the truck and where the window was anyway. And I just stuck my arm out through where the window was supposed to be and showed her. And she's like, what the fuck? And I said, I'll be back tomorrow. She said, I'll be here at eight o'clock in the morning. I'll see you then. So then I get back and I go back through the subdivision and back down my road and the wind is blowing through my hair. And I call and there's a place right over here, a couple miles from the house that does window, power window repairs and everything. But for the one time in the last, since she went to California back in August, Stace is not here. She's got Harley and she's got the car and she's 45 minutes away. To come over here and get me to, I said, fuck it. I said, I'll wait till she comes back in the morning. And then I'll, t but in the meantime, in the morning at eight o'clock, I'll go over to the post office because it's going to rain Friday afternoon. And the last thing I want is to have no window in the rain. So I'll go to the post office at eight o'clock on Friday morning and then come back and meet Stace. And then she can take me over to blah, 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 blah. Right. So Friday morning at eight o'clock, I'm in, it's still almost dark, 745 actually, I'm in, I'm in the car and I'm starting it up, right? And it's not bad. It's not nippy like it is today. So in the, in the almost pre-dawn hours, I go back over to the post office with no window and I get everything on the dolly and I wheel it in and guess what happened? Brian, it was the best thing that happened. They said, you didn't have to worry about coming back yesterday because we didn't get our internet service back until 5.30 yesterday afternoon. So I would have been a very pissed off guy if I had to come back. 
but I, now I've got a brand new internet and brand new thing, and she whipped that stuff out. We sent out almost 200 individual envelopes containing pictures and certificates. So the first 200 orders to Cornette's Collectibles are already on the way to the fine customers out there. I get back in a truck, start it up, start to head home, and guess what happened, Brian? Here comes the rain again. Oh, man. <laughs> if it had just held 10 minutes, 10 fucking minutes, I would have been home. But no, now I'm driving through the, the, through the subdivision from the post office with not only the wind in my hair, but also the rain because it's coming in sideways. <laughs> I'm a motherfucker. And I get back home and then I find the only clear piece of plastic i've got all the hefty bags right that are garbage bags they're green you can't see through them well i don't want to fucking blind myself on the way over to the to the window repair place but i got to cover this window up so i finally on a, a dry cleaning bag from a suit that i had dry cleaned 10 years ago and stuck in the back of the closet and I taped that over the window and then Stace comes home and then we take it over there and and it rains all day. And then finally they call, they had it fixed, and we go over in the rain, we get that and we come back. Guess how much it costs to fix a power window, Brian Last? $750. God damn it, Ed McMahon, you fucked me again. $471. Huh. Ed McMahon always used to do that to Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson would ask some question expecting an answer that a reasonable person would give so that then he could hit it with the punchline and you would just go out of, out of bounds and over and above what's, what's going on. You did that on purpose, didn't you? Yes, sir. You are correct, sir. That is right. Sir. All right. Anyway, but the first shipment was de would delayed one day, but was successful. And now already, for about 150 of you that ordered a copy of Behind the Curtain domestically and nothing else, those are already wrapped up and are going out, and this comes out tomorrow as we speak, on Monday, and already another 70 or 80 orders of just DVDs only are already wrapped up and ready to be sent out, and I'm, I'm tackling T-shirts by the end of the week if you just ordered a T-shirt, because those are quicker. I'm trying to get the bulk of these to their intended recipients as quick as possible, but the the process has begun, ladies and gentlemen. And we'll see how long it takes me to fight our... But if you've got a dog in this fight or money in this, in this venture, as so many of you do, it has begun. And it can happen to you. Remember, we said that about something else last time. It can happen to you when I was sending out 2,000 figures. All right, there's big news on another front. Oh, great, Brian Last. Of uh, I'm just making news on the collectibles front all over the place. These collectibles front, collectibles back, collectibles tops and bottoms. I'm dealing with heritage auctions now. I mentioned that I teased a little bit about this a few months ago, but it took a while for the grading process to be to be done and come through, but. You and I have talked about this before, and you, of course, are the repository now of the assembled Pro Wrestling Enterprises Wrestling News files and archive of all of the, the programs, magazines, pictures, and everything that our old friend Norman Keitzer published in, in the low many years ago, the late 60s through the 80s. And Brian Bucantis expertly took care of after that. Yes, Brian Buchanan had the whole thing together at his palatial estate until it was trucked to you, and now you've got everything. But one of the most unlikely things that Norman Keitzer and Pro Wrestling Enterprises ha has been involved in is the fact that something that they, well, I shouldn't say something, they did a lot of great magazines and programs, and people collect those, but something that's gone way out of whack over the past several years has been the little innocuous wrestling trading card sets that Norm did. 
And it, at the time, I was still, I was just starting to get in the business. I was still a, you know, a, a contributing photographer for the wrestling news. And, and Norm and the folks at Pro Wrestling Enterprises were the ones that were printing my championship wrestling magazine that we were selling in the arenas. And they came up, Norman did, with the idea to do wrestling trading cards because he was a big baseball fan too and he liked collectible things. And so, you know, I didn't think much about it at the time because, you know, it was just, it was, I think you will, you will probably concur, Brian, that Norman's printing sometimes wasn't the most expensive and he did sometimes, you know, cut the corners and these weren't large print runs of things. And so it was just another thing that, you know, Norman was doing along with the programs and stuff. 40 and, and, years go ahead well actually i was going to just say with the cards specifically and i know a little bit about them i actually own the rights to the cards but um what i was going to say is there actually was a pretty significant print run and it didn't sell that great that's why he was still selling them up until you know whatever the late 90s sheldon goldberg at one point bought like a ton of them from norman kaiser you know the collectible market for those cards is as interesting as the story behind the cards well, yes, and and that's the thing is that, you know, suddenly in 40 years later, people have found out or realized or come to the conclusion that this was the first set of wrestling trading cards in the modern era. The last ones had been done on any kind of mainstream basis. It wasn't just do-it-yourself or local territory stuff. Right. Um, because Scott Tino you know, has the, those really cool ones from Chattanooga. yeah the racks most beef yeah. that you know Nick or George wandered into a racks and met the manager probably one day and they got trading cards. I mean I don't know how it came up, but but there were a few territory things. But on a national basis with all the stars, there the last sets had been in the fifties uh, with the network TV and and the you know the black and white trading cards that we've seen those oversized things. But anyway. So this has suddenly become rediscovered. And even though Hulk Hogan had been in the business for three or four years at the time of this first set, it's his first trading card. So it's considered the Hulk Hogan rookie card. And we talked about this a while back that they were appreciating. And then, gosh, a couple of years ago with the, you know, everything, all the other collectible cards, this stuff just mushroomed. And a lot of it's based on condition because... Well, let's say, just to throw a number out there, and it's bigger than this. Let's say there's 100 of those Hulk Hogan cards. How many of them are in mint condition, centered, focused? How many of them are in perfect condition? And well, that's there, where it comes yeah. in. There's what comes into play also is Norman's, Norman's printing processes because they not only count, you can have a perfect card with square corners and sharp corners and whole nine yards, but if the centering is not correct. That takes like points off or it gives it demerits or whatever. And the thing is, I'm like, fuck Norman's magazines weren't even centered properly. Right. So then according to what else I've been told, as we investigated this, the Andre, the giant card is the absolute hardest card of these sets to get in any kind of high grade condition because it was the top card in the set. And when they were shrink wrapped, it dulled the Andre corners. And then they've also, they're the bright colored borders lend themselves to chipping because they're so bright and nice when they're brand new, but they, they chip easily in this whole nine yards. So this set has been, you know, one of the, the pitfalls of, of Norman's processing, but also has driven the value up for cards that are, you know, in, in high grade condition. Fortunately, for just such an occasion, ladies and gentlemen, I've had a set of these cards since they came out because my photography is featured. I've not only had a set of the, the first, first set, but I had complete sets of the all three sets that they released. And they've never actually been sold ever since I didn't buy them. Since my photography was part of them, I was sent complimentary sets courtesy of our friend Norman Keitzer. So they've never been circulated. They've been sitting in the in the vault for 40 years, right? And finally, when I heard what, you know, was going on with these things, I got a hold of a 
a friend of mine, actually, I got a couple of friends. Uh, one of them will probably be on the show next week to discuss pro wrestling collectibles in general uh, in his uh, status and position at the Heritage Auctions. But I got a hold of a couple of these guys and said, what can we do with these? So they have been uh, evaluated by Heritage, uh, b several of them, a number of them, should say more than several, have been graded by the folks at SGC. And, uh, Brent, did you know, let me ask you this. Well, you're a baseball fan, so you may know this, but a lot of people may not. But the grading system on the uh, the cards, Is right? a massive it's scam, a, yes. Well, no, it's a 1 through 10. Oh, yes, you, yes. You yes. sound like a, a per, person who's been spurned. No, I haven't. I just know a little bit about the process and a little bit about people who work at the places, and I know a little bit of... Well, these are fine people. I know they are. They use... I don't know SGC. Like SGC case. may be the cream of the crop. Well, but anyway, the point is it's a 1 through 10 yes. scale, right? But do you know... Okay, then, so what would you say if 1 is poor... And 10 is Jim Mint, G-E-M, -G like a gem, absolutely perfect, flawless Jim Mint. That's 10. And one is poor. What do you think five would be? Five would be uh, Matt Hardy. Oh, come on. It's the middle. What do you want me to say? <laughs> between, what, 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 what do what, I think? What's the word I would pick that? between the poor? Word, the, the, yes. How would you quantify that there? What, how would you describe that? Okay. If gem mint is 10, below that is, let's say, mint. Below that is, let's say, excellent. Let's say, very good, good. I would say, maybe good, depending on the scale. No. Five is excellent. Wow. Here, that's because I saw because I saw these cards obviously in person, and then I, you know, I was waiting for the grades to come out, and I was, I was somewhat, I was like, well, what? Well, here's sevens and eights, and there's a nine, but that seems kind of low. And then I would listen to this scale and see if this pans out for you logically. One is poor. One point five is fair. Two is good. Three is very good. Four, very good to excellent. Now, there's a lot of range in there. Five is excellent. Six is excellent to near mint. Seven is near mint. Eight is near mint to mint. Nine is mint. And ten is gem mint. What a waste of time. Which you almost never, ever get so it's really it's a one through nine almost but with five can be excellent so my sevens and eights and nines why they're just swell but anyway this auction i should mention and, and as i said we're going to talk more about it on the shows upcoming over the next couple of weeks but the auction at heritage auctions it's the november fall sports collectibles catalog sale it opens on october 28th the website is ha.com for heritage auctions uh ha.com the auction closes on november the 18th you can bid from october 28th through november 18th but as i said basically here's the deal um it's the wrestling card sets 1982 and 1983 from pro wrestling enterprises the wrestling all-stars and they're my personal collection that has never been sold anywhere and has never been circulated and it is graded uh the ones that were graded uh, have been deemed the jim Cornette collection um several of them feature my photography but the the andre that is so hard that just bedevils people i was kind of disappointed with a six until i saw that that's excellent to near mint and that's the hardest card and uh, the Hulk Hogan is there is actually there is a uh, there's two Hulk Hogan's that's going to be involved. So um, I won't give anything away, but my Harley race got an eight point five. So if you're in the market for a real if you're in the market for a real clean Harley race with low mileage and cool air. Um, I'm trying to look. There are so many numbers and so many letters in capitals and in bold NM to NMMT. Etc. But anyway, everybody's there. The Sheik, 
Got a 9.5. That's almost as good as you can get. Sweet Brown Sugar Cocoa Ware got a mint nine. Um, anyway, yes, all of those various things are going to be there October 28th through November 18th at HA.com Heritage Auctions, the November Fall Sports Collectibles Catalog. By crack. My flair is a 7.5. That apparently is, it's in between near mint and near mint to mint. How do you make that? minute of an adjudication like i said i think it's all a scam well what's not a scam geez you're running my business off what's not a scam no i'm not saying your cards aren't in great shape and i think the whole grading system is a fucking scam and i think they rip people off daily and i don't think it's just baseball cards i think it's comic books i think it's all these people on the fucking waiting list just to get their shit graded have my attitude hey i got great shit this is in perfect condition I'm going to put it away. And now it's mine. That's it. There's the attitude. I'm not sending it to someone. I remember when I used to be asked to DJ fucking things in Brooklyn and I would show up and I would just plug in my phone and do my playlist and I would, you know, go with the room. And if I felt there was a good song to add in and these other guys would be there with their records, like, how could you not bring your records? I said, you're a fucking idiot. Why would I ever bring my records out of my house? That's when something (laughs) happens to them. That's when a junky idiot like that guy in the corner steals it. No, no, no. I got all the songs right here. They'll sound the same to these drunk idiots in this room right now than they would if I had the fucking vinyl that you're going to have to go schlep on the subway home. And that's the you Brian mean, Last Corner for this week, ladies and gentlemen. You mean these idiots would carry boxes of vinyl records on the subway? Yeah. they would. <laughs> there was one thing I actually got to do. I'm not even going to say the name and embarrass the guy. It was me and a famous fucking DJ in that scene. And I had my little fucking phone with my wacky little playlist, and I tore the house down. And then the more famous person went on after me, and everyone fucking left. And I loved it, because I just I had a great time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but right now you're a malcontent with a grumpy Brian. Grumpy Brian last. Honest See, Brian I'm, last. Truthful I'm, Brian last. I'm over here just trying to hawk some pro wrestling trading cards, and you're c- condemning the entire collectibles grading system. How much do you think you're going to get? How many hundreds of thousands of dollars do you expect? No, to get? now come on. It's a, it's a, there's something a, a affordable for everyone. Here it is. I encourage everybody to go and and take a look and and uh, you're going to actually you can preview this stuff too uh, very soon. We're going to have a link uh, as soon as I have uh, Hotchkiss and the Heritage Auctions uh, social media guy uh, have their get together on the phone. We're going to have a link on jimcornett.com where you'll be able to actually go straight to the auction and take a look at pictures of all these cards and everything. But they're, they are very cool. But who would have thought of all the rare shit that I have in my collection and know is rare shit and have always recognized was valuable is this little few little packs of trading cards uh, suddenly out of nowhere. Cinderella story. Anyway. Yeah, Sheldon Goldberg, though. He, years ago, he had a whole bunch of them, and he was selling them. You know, he was ahead of the game with Matt Marketplace, like tracking the whole collectibles market and who had what, where you can get cool things. And you go back and you look now at some of those old issues, and you see the prices of things, and you realize, wow, it really was a collector's market because those things <laughs> that were $5 there are now hundreds of dollars now. Well, and as, uh, my amazing fantasy 15 that was actually, you know, over that period of what, 45 years that I had, it was probably better, better than buying most stocks. It appreciated in value a thousand times. You got those cards. I got the contract you signed. So your cards, <laughs> so your photos can be used in those cards. <laughs> ah, you paperwork hound. I mean, one of these days when you get far enough into that, file cabinet we'll have the lowdown on the the real scoop behind watergate and everything else no kidding um speaking of of history and learning things some people never learn but other people like to learn and if you like to learn we uh, it's the book corner because we got to just plug a bunch of books all of a sudden here that have have come up from different uh different sources Uh, we've talked about the incredible histories of Northern California wrestling and Southern California wrestling that our friend rock rims has done. And every time we mention them and I finally got him, I, I had not heard about him. He doesn't get enough publicity, 
but I finally got them. You you had had one for a while, and you got the other one, and we just raved over them here on the show. But every time that we would, you know, talk about how great these books are, complete histories, not just of the modern day territory, but of the of pro wrestling in Northern California since the dawn of pro wrestling, and same for Southern California, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Incredibly detailed pictures out the ass, blah, 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 everything you'd ever want to know. But every time we go to talk about them, they're already sold out. And so we'd say, well, if you could ever get these things, well, and then um, several weeks ago, Rock scared us because he was thinking about uh, dropping his wrestling projects and moving on to some other stuff that he's got in a pipeline that he wanted to do, other writing things and other fields, whatever. But he's, I guess he's just been worn down. He's beat up by all the people who want these incredible books. So he is acquiesced to reprinting both of the books. And we just got this email. What is today? Um, this email is about four or five days ago. I don't know how big the pr print run is going to be, but if you message him at rock rims r o c k r i m s at a o l dot com and say i want one or both of those books uh you can get in on it first come first served and the they're they're worth it is and well you can testify to that and you don't like anything today he does fantastic work fantastic research a good writer and i was incredibly happy to see he announced this week that he's actually going to be teaming up with Kurt Brown, Vandal Drummond, to do a book on Southern California Lucha Libre history, which should be just completely fascinating. So I'm very excited about that, too. So anyway, rockrims at AOL.com. Message him there. The books are offered on a first-come, first-served basis. We don't know whether he's going to do these again or not. So get in while you still can. And uh, also. You talk about this one, where it can be uh, obtained, because you sent it to me, but we've done so many um, historical pieces lately on St. Louis wrestling in the 50s and 40s and 50s and 60s, and uh, how instrumental it was. We talked about Scott Teal's St. Louis program reprint uh, volumes here several weeks ago. Now, the, one of the most awesome-looking pro wrestling collectible books I've ever seen in my life Wrestling at the Chase has been released by a guy named Ed Wheatley, uh, who's been a sports writer, et cetera, in, in the St. Louis area for years and is obviously friends with Herb Simmons and new Larry Matizic and, you know, was tied into the St. Louis wrestling scene. But the printing on this thing, you sent it to me, probably to try to suck up to me for something I haven't found out yet. No, I try to motivate you to... Get off your ass and let's do some more books. All right, all right. But anyway, where did you get that thing, and and uh, how can the folks get it? I was surprised. I had gotten a heads up about it a little while back that there was a coffee table book coming out about wrestling in the chase, and I thought, that sounds fantastic. There's no way it could be good. Just because you would think <laughs> it'd be a coffee table book, it has to look good, it has to be well-formatted, and wrestling usually isn't treated that way in book form. And boy, was I pleasantly surprised. Although not perfect in some of the photo choices, it is a spectacular book filled with history, looks beautiful, it's classy, dare I say, despite yes. having a bruiser or two on the cover. It's incredible, and I got it on Amazon. Anyone can go to Amazon.com right now and look for Wrestling at the Chase. It, I think, will be the first book that pops up, but I couldn't believe it. I, you know, what do you think, Jim? Because, you know, you actually... You know, especially with the um, scrapbook, one of the things people still talk about is how cool it was. It was formatted in a really cool way. What did you think of this book when you saw it? Well, shit. Um, <laughs> 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 no, compared to compared to this book, the Midnight Express scrapbook was, you know, a 16-year-old girl staying up late at night pasting stuff in a photo album. Um, and a lot of that is due to the fact that printing has come a long way. And a lot of the, that is due to the fact that, you know, that's the first thing that I'd ever watched someone lay out. And cause you know, I didn't do it. It was Tim Ash, my old dear friend and sat and pointed and saying, we'll put that there. And 
you know, this, and it was a soft cover, but, you know, square bound, but a soft cover. It was a cool book, the Midnight Express book, for the information and the pictures it contained, but it wasn't an art book. This thing is an art book, and the information, it, it deals obviously primarily with wrestling in St. Louis between 1959 and 1983, because that was the run of wrestling at the chase, although it does have some preamble historical context on St. Louis, uh, mentions of the first uh, two-year run of St. Louis wrestling TV that we've talked about that was sponsored by Stag Beer that we talked about here on the show several weeks ago. But primarily it's the wrestling at the chase years and how it all came about, but they have access not only to some great historical wrestling photos. And, and as we mentioned, Herb Simmons is a big part of that. And he's been involved in the St. Louis wrestling scene forever. And, but they have actual historical pictures of St. Louis, of the Keel auditorium of, you know, behind the scenes at KPLR television. And, and so it's, and when you open it up, the ink smells incredible, the high quality paper. I could sleep on this book, right? It's just, it's, it's so nice. So, yes, Wrestling at the Chase, for all of you interested in those days, a really nice display book that you can, you know, kids can just look through the pictures for heaven's sake, although I wouldn't let them touch it since they'll get fucking peanut butter and jelly on it. Um, And one more book before we go. Uh, we mentioned Scott Teal and his stuff at Crowbar Press. Uh, crowbarpress.com. Yeah. And he is he did the St. Louis programs from the early 40s that we discussed. He's done the Amarillo history, the Knoxville history, so many of the different cities, biographies of the guys. But the book that I just got in the mail yesterday and haven't even had time, to, I've got the first 20 pages or whatever done, but I want to get into it as soon as I can, is our friend Bert Prentice passed away, what, it was back in August now. Um, he was working with Scott Teal on his more or less autobiography. It's a it, it's an, it, a series of interviews that he had done with Scott that was going to be uh, turned into a biography of Bird or an autobiography. And instead, what Scott has done here is released in kind of chronological form the actual interviews. So Bert's telling his story in his own words from his birth until, you know, the very last interview that they had, which was just a couple weeks before he passed away. And we mentioned that Bert was classic old time wrestling promoter. And this book, just from what I've seen and Lawler who wrote the intro and, and, you know, just flipping through and what I know about Bert, it's uh, this book backs that up. He was, he was six years old when he got smartened up to the wrestling business because his mother was uh, a ticket seller for not only Vern Gagne's AWA, but also Joe Dusick's Omaha territory. And, you know, and, and the boys were over at the house and I mean, she traveled to spot shows. She didn't go like to Denver or to, you know, the big towns, but where they were from in Iowa was right in the middle of the four corners of oh my geography. Now, Minnesota and Iowa and what was it, Nebraska, whatever. And it, much like, you know, the people that helped Christine Jarrett, the Bert's mother would go to the different towns and either sell tickets or he would be, you know, selling pictures of the guys for, you know, they'd give him a quarter a night or whatever. And he felt ripped off later on when he got smart or, uh, you know, helping with the merchandise tables or whatever at all these spot shows that, that they ran. So he was smartened up at, you know, at the age of six and, started promoting his own little amateur wrestling federation when he was like 14, where they actually sold tickets for like a quarter or whatever. And just to, for stragglers that would come by and gawk at him. <clears throat> but anyway, and Bert never got out of the wrestling business and he always found a way to make something work for some period of time. And, and the, I guess it should be mentioned at the time of the pandemic, when the pandemic hit and nobody even realized this, we did when we talked to Bert and I'm uh, on the show here a few years back. And also I'd mentioned some of his shows before, but he was running 12 or 13 events a month between the, 
little TV taping he was doing for the Jackson, Tennessee cable, you know, company in the basement of the Jackson Coliseum and the intermittent big shows there and spot shows around West Tennessee. It maybe not drawing, you know, more than a couple hundred people, but he was running 12 shows a fucking week and, and nobody heard about it because it was just local wrestling shows to sell tickets to local wrestling fans. So anyway, I can't wait to get through the rest of it, but it's tonight, tonight, tonight by Burt Prentice and Scott Teal, because that's what you think of when you hear about Burt <laughs> or when you think about Burt is him screaming at the people tonight, 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 get your tickets. The most important thing that's ever happened in the world tonight. You have to hear the story Howard Baum tells on 605, you know, and now that 605 has been out a little while, I'll tell you a part of it. The whole thing's incredible and it's quite entertaining because Howard's a great storyteller. Bert ripped off Howard and his dad in like 1985. <laughs> they were going to promote stuff together in Florida. Bert left his suitcase filled with papers or whatever in Howard's college dorm, went to meet with the guy. That, that was the collateral. Went, yeah, right. went, went to meet with the guy who owned the farm that they were going to run the show on the farm in Florida and took off. And once they realized he wasn't coming back, Howard opened the briefcase and it was filled with G-strings, <laughs> which raises the question, where do you get all these G-strings all at once? But anyway. But, that, but that's, a, that's a, a classic old trick. Now, when you need to, to get out of somewhere, look here, I got this valuable suitcase. And I'll leave it with you until I come back. And if anything happens, well, you'd have the contents of my valuable suitcase. He didn't even do that. That's how good he was. He was <laughs> subtle about it. He just left it there, didn't say anything. He goes, I'm just going to leave this here. I got to do things. <laughs> All these years later, Bert was on social media promoting something. And Howard finally called him out. Hey, you know, you ripped off me and my dad. Bert became like the nicest guy. Not, not became the nicest guy, but Bert was very nice about it and said, I'm very sorry about that. I'd love to make it right. And Howard kept calling his bluff and calling him names. And Bert kept saying, I'm at the post office right now. I'm about to send it. Tell me the address. <laughs> All these years later, Bert made good. And no one knew he was sick, or at least we didn't know the level of how sick. I, I didn't know he was sick, period. But something in him before, before the end, he decided to make good with at least Howard. And that says a lot about the guy, I think. I think that's tremendous. Uh, tonight, 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 and all the other fine publications at Crowbar Press. And by the way, these are all unpaid advertisements. We just think w w that our fans, our fans, our listeners, the people, the cult of Cornette, uh, these are great books that they need to read if they like rest, because we're certainly not going to be able to see any current programs that are going to titillate our taste buds like the classic wrestling. And you could tell this wasn't a paid spot because we didn't talk about how you could beat your kids with the books or throw them at people. Yeah, you, could throw, you could put somebody's eye out. Hide drugs in these books. Just cut a yeah. hole in and hide your drugs. Yeah, hollow out the wrestling at the chase book. Put your drugs in it. And if anybody tries to fucking steal it, you can put their eye out with the corners. It's so <laughs> anyway, um, uh, we have had tons of people, uh, welcoming back our conquering hero, the illustrious illustrator himself, Travis Heckle. That's his new gimmick now, the illustrious illustrator. He's the most famous artist on the planet. Um, he is worming his way back in <laughs> to the... No, actually, he's working his way back into the swing of things with some intermittent art. We're still taking some of the guest submissions while he's on the mend, but... Uh, I feel like we've taken a back seat here, Brian. You and I, all we do is just talk. But Travis creates the art. And now you go to the to the YouTube channel there, official Jim Cornette on YouTube, which would do, are we at 254,000 subscribers now? Uh, I think so, because we were at 253 the other day, and I haven't looked in the last couple yeah, of days. Yeah, well, that's, it's, it's just growing by leaps and bounds. But anyway, um, all the comments are, welcome back, Travis. Oh, it's good to see Travis back. Oh, so we've just... We become secondary characters in our own play uh, 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 underneath the illustrious illustrator. But Travis is back doing some art. We've got some other fine artists that, have, that now have all the heat taken off of them. Now that people know they're going to be able to have their Travis, they're being more respectful and polite to the guest artists that have been <laughs> exposing their goddamn guts to the world to be eviscerated with the rapier-like 
wit of the YouTube commentators. Um, but we did do some good. We 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 done a good deed, Brian. We and did. No good, no good deed goes unpunished. We'll see where this leads. But I have an email. That's how you can tell. Hi, Jim and Brian. I'm a longtime listener, first time emailer. I love your shows. My name is Elias. And oh, I'm come from, on. Not, not that don't, one. Don't, don't. Not that one. Okay. No, not that one. He's, he's poisoned the name Elias. Elias was a good Christian name given to people in a biblical fashion after their parents knew each other in a biblical fashion. And now that one idiot with a guitar, <laughs> really, a good name. My name is Elias, and I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And he's ruined Vancouver, too. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to your show, as I always do, when I heard an old familiar name from yesteryear. Illustrations by Danny Williams. I had a friend back in 1993 when I was in third grade that loved to draw, and he was also named Danny Williams. I wondered if this was the same person. I googled him, and it was the same Danny Williams. What a small world. Wouldn't you know who won the pony? I contacted him and am now in touch with him after 28 years, all because of you, Jim and Brian. What do you think about that, Brian? That sounds nice. I understand Danny has changed his number and gone on the road. <laughs> I was going to follow it up with saying, and now this <laughs> cocksucker reminded me that I owe him $100. <laughs> no, no, that anyway, is I'm nice. That, that is very nice. Though. That's cool. I'm glad we could reunite uh, Danny and Elias. So now Danny and Elias are walking with each other together somewhere. Or Danny's walking with him, one way, however that worked. I, uh, <laughs> what? Who were I? We remember he, Elias always wanted somebody to take a walk with him. Was that what it was? You had, you had to walk with? Yeah, I guess he it was that. to walk with Elias. Yeah, I, I wished he'd take a long walk on a short pier. I never saw anyone walk with him. Didn't he always walk Nobody out by himself? Walked. He always, he was either by himself or somebody was kicking the shit out of him. <laughs> yeah. Possibly because of his guitar playing. Nobody would accept that invitation to go walking. Tiptoeing through the tulips, even. Well, Jim, let's uh, talk a little bit more about YouTube. Go tiptoeing through the yard. And I just want to say once again, we really thank everyone, all the amazing guest artists. You've seen their work. You're going to be seeing more of their work and, of course, more of Travis's work as he gets back into the swing of things. And there was one he did the other day that a lot of people liked with him. Well, not with him, but he drew you with <laughs> superstar Billy Graham and the casket of the CWA. I thought that was a pretty cool yes, one. That, well, I was going to say, I didn't see Travis in that particular <laughs> portrait. That fine piece of work. That's right. But uh, we're happy to have Travis back, and we're really appreciative of all the guest artists. And uh, who knew that the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel would turn into a bastion of creativity like it has? Well, you're exactly right. It's a bastion. Of, it's a bastion of bastards. is what it is. <laughs> A bastion for bastards. If you're a bastard out there that would like a bastion, well, then... Come right on, or Sebastian Cabot. I don't know, but Travis is our hero. And you know what? If you'd like a hero, I got one for you. I need a hero. I'm looking out for a hero. If you need a hero, like I need a hero, we all needs a hero, go to Stat Hero. Because they are the heroes of stats. And obviously, you don't have any idea what that means. And neither did I until I read more. <laughs> of the copy they sent until I read more you about our know. fine friends at stat hero stat hero is the first ever daily fantasy sports book that puts the player in control and winning within reach. No longer do you have to rip your fingernails out, leaving bloody stumps to reach winning because now it's within reach. And here's how it works. Stat hero shows you their lineups and dares you to beat them. It's you versus the house in a head-to-head -head fantasy matchup where you name your stakes and the winner takes all. But you've got the advantage because Stat Hero is showing you their lineups ahead of time. No one else does that. You know why? Because apparently that's cheating. Is that not cheating, Brian? Are you? Wouldn't you be cheating these people if they show you their lineups and then you go ahead and make your bets on whatever the fuck these people are betting on? 
Not only that seems, it seems almost too easy. Well, maybe too easy, but I don't think that's cheating if they just say, hey, look what we got. Now you do what you want. I don't think that's cheating. Well, all right. Well, in that case, folks, if you want to play a spirited game of you show me yours and I'll show you mine, go to the folks at stathero.com now. Go to stathero.com slash JCE and sign up for free. What do you got to lose? All your money eventually, but right <laughs> no, no, don't look at it that way. Don't no, I mean, if, if you just went on and on and on and on, that's what you would have. But right now, signing up for free, you got nothing to lose. And you can get a 100% bonus match on your first deposit when you use the promo code JCE. So if they're matching your first deposit, that's where it comes in. What do you have to lose? Well, you could lose, you know, more after that, but nevertheless, you could also win because you're cheating. You're cheating these people because they're showing you their lineups. If I had ever bet on sports, I would have always wanted to go to a person that would show me what they were going to do before they did it. Because then I'd know. I'd know what I'm talking about here. Folks, go to stathero.com slash jce and enter the promo code jce for the 100 percent first deposit match and if you bet on the daily fantasy sports do they make up their own players is that part of the fantasy no. or do they use real players in a simulated contest much like that computer fight between who was it, Muhammad Ali and Rocky Marciano years well, no, ago? No, that's that's not. <laughs> I don't think that's exactly how it works. I think basically. You act like you're the general manager or the manager of a team and you put the team together that doesn't actually exist as a team and then you do well based on the stats that happen in the real world for your fantasy team. Okay. There's a wall of fantasy, but there's a whole other side of reality on the other side of that wall. There's a wall of fantasy with a whole land of reality on the other side of the wall of fantasy. And you, using your wits and skills <laughs> figure out a way to get through that wall and land in the reality on the other side. Cause you're a hero. Of course you and can get through the wall. And, you, and when you, and when you bust through that wall and, and, and reach the promised land, you are a hero. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, stathero.com <laughs> slash JCE for, and sign up for free and get, and they'll give you money. Also, they'll match money that you give them. And just don't lose it. Well, I guess the biggest news of this week is Tony Khan is the bell of the ball. Tony Khan is the most popular guy on the on the, the scene because Tony Khan has been named the most beloved billionaire. <laughs> All right. I'm not making this up. Tony Khan has been named the most beloved billionaire in the world by a website called money.co.uk so this is obviously it's a a uk based website i didn't think tony was that popular over there but here's how did did you hear brian how they based this in because vince is on the list too but did you hear how they based this i actually didn't hear anything about this list or this award or how they've done this i know nothing about this oh Oh, oh my God. Well, then you've got to sit back here for a second. They basically rated all the billionaires, or at least the, the top bunch, based on how much of their social media mentions is positive. So in other words, because more what? people because more people say positive things about Tony Khan on Twitter and the internet in general than any of the other billionaires. He's the most beloved billionaire in the world, according to this website. And Vince is number seven. Where's Warren Buffett? I don't have the list in front of me. I didn't notate where everybody placed. But Vince was number seven. And the thing about it is... I. Oh, God, who was the... Who's the, the, the one that gets all the news... Bezos or somebody Jeff like that. Jeff Bezos, he, yes, that's his name. Well, the, whoever got Amazon. 65 million searches was number one or whatever. It was on the, the search list, the one of the big billionaires. Because, see, that's the thing. The most searched billionaire list 
and the most beloved billionaire list was two different things. And the the totals of money that these billionaires supposedly have acquired, it was way skewed to the big time billionaires on the searches list and et cetera. But Tony slipped in with only, they only credit him for $8 billion. He's a, merely a pauper on this list because the, the top guys were just off the charts. Is his dad on the list? Well, I, you know, actually, maybe his dad is neither popular nor unpopular, and he didn't place at all. Because, you know, Trump. Because nobody talks about him. In the 80s, Trump lied to Forbes to get on the Forbes list, saying yes. he was a billionaire, pretending all of his dad's assets were his. And this isn't even meant as a shot at Tony Khan, but is he a billionaire now? Or is he a billionaire on paper once, you know, in, in years? Is he a billionaire well, see, now? You know, That's the question. You know, see, you're, you're trying to confuse facts into this thing. <laughs> this is this is the billionaires that get talked about on Twitter. But anyway, apparently Vince. But do you have to be a billionaire? It. I guess that's the question. Is oh, he you got to be a billionaire? A, well, you got to be a billionaire or get credit for it. And they gave Vince credit for like two billion and Tony for like eight billion. But everybody else on the in the especially in the top ten was just tens of billions and hundreds of billions or whatever. Uh, but they slipped in because obviously they're the billionaires involved in wrestling. And as we know, there is a certain segment of the wrestling fandom that likes to get on Twitter every now and then. So this kind of skews this whole fucking exaggeration and journey through hysteria to begin with. You You can determine the most beloved billionaire based on how much tweeting about them is positive. I have found the list here. Oh, oh, okay. Number 10, Sergey Brin, one of the uh, founders of Google. Number 9, Giovanni Ferraro. Who? Number 8, Evan Spiegel. Number 7, Vince McMahon. That is so surprising. Number now, does it, does, do, do they have the, the billion dollar values with no, them on this list? No values here. See, I, I saw one had the values, but go ahead. And actually, I don't know. Vince McMahon's a billionaire. Even with all of his Class A stock. But anyway, that's another question for another time. David Tepper. Number five, Warren Buffett. Number four, Bill Gates, despite all the scandals, still very popular. Number three, Elon Musk. Number He's the one. He's the one that got the most searches, I think. Number two, Mackenzie Scott. And number one with 39% social sentiment. <laughs> Whatever the hell that means. Tony Khan. But now that means only 39% of his social media was positive and he's number one. 60% so, of the people told him to go to hell. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> apparently being a billionaire is like being the nicest guy in prison. It's, it's not much of an honor, even if you're the most beloved one. But d d did they have the list on there of the, the other list where it was just the most searched billionaires? Because then Vince... I think was on top of that one or not on top of everybody, but he was higher placed than Tony Khan. I am uh, right now looking to see if I can access this. I have the most search billionaires list right here. Uh, number one, as you stated before, Elon Musk with 64,677,930 searches. That seems like a lot. Number two is Jeff Bezos from Amazon and now from outer space. Number three is Bill Gates, whether in the boardroom, developing Microsoft, or on Jeffrey Epstein's plane. Bill Gates, still number three on this list. At number four, the boy who may be a robot, Mark Zuckerberg, number four here on the <laughs> list. At number five, he's still driving that old station wagon, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, number five. We mentioned Mackenzie Scott before, and then there's a bunch of other people, and who gives a crap? Vince McMahon, number nine on the list. Right before Rupert Murdoch. So maybe we'll get a Tony, few there. Where's Tony on that list? Tony didn't make the top 10 on the most searched. Uh, Tony didn't make the top 10. Larry Page, Steve Cohn, Larry Ellison, Sergey Brin. No, he didn't make the top 20, actually. He's not here at all. So the, most popular, me. the most popular billionaire in the world didn't make the top 20 in number of searches. I mean, you're looking here and you see it's a lot of searches. Vince McMahon at number nine was 3,850,560 searches. 
I guess I am surprised that Tony, I thought Tony Khan would have been searched more. Uh, but he, I don't, I don't think you need to search for Tony. I think he's out there in front of everybody <laughs> already. You don't have to look hard at all. It's like almost like uh, Cody and Brandy. You don't have to look any distance at all. Oh, You'll see unfair. them everywhere. Don't, They're going to be in your home movies. Say what you want about his booking. Don't compare him to Cody and Brandy. That's not nice. That's the worst oh. thing you've said about the guy. Well, he's been all over the place lately. I mean, it's like there was a time there that, you know, Michael Caine was in every movie that was released. Now Tony Khan's in every news story. Not only is he the most beloved billionaire, but these, these uh, amateur Zapruders now out there have taken a picture of him holding a notebook at a football game and made that trend on Twitter because they think that they've revealed the big card for the next pay-per-view all out double or nothing triple whammy Vegas or bust. What's their next pay-per-view? I believe the next pay-per-view is full gear, full gear. We get out of the, Casino theme and more into the mechanics of automobiles. The car racing theme. Hopefully that the, the the light at the end of the tunnel will be the headlight on an oncoming train. But anyway, you saw this. You heard about this, right? The big reveal of his notebook. I saw this after the fact, and my first thought was, to be quite honest with you, brilliant. What a great move. Got everyone talking. But who knows what's going on? You think it was on purpose? Is there anything there that was embarrassing? Or was it something that if it leaked <laughs> out, people would go, oh shit, here's the card. I that, would, that would have been great if his notebook had said, call hookers. Yeah. Penis, you know, vagina, penis vagina, <laughs> penis vagina. Penis vagina, penis <laughs> vagina. Book hookers for casino on 23rd. Tell QT three kilos. Jacksonville. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this didn't used to happen because there wasn't the, the high resolution photography. And if you took a picture of somebody from six feet away holding a note, you can read the fucking notebook, right? With a professional camera. But now I guess you can zoom in, enhance, read anything. But it was, I saw the picture. It was chicken scratching that one would assume that possibly a you know 16 year old 10th grader would be taking notes in his class that he didn't really care too much about but it had a you know a card for the pay-per-view and i get the only one that i didn't really understand or that came out of left field to me was uh, do you think they're actually going to put brian danielson in the ring against john moxley uh, 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 could there be a bigger clash of styles in the history of professional wrestling that would make the Sheik and Luthez look positively complimentary to each other. Uh, but otherwise than that, it's a card of matches for the pay-per-view. It's not the goddamn secrets of the lost Ark of the covenant. So I don't know that it, but as we've already established, a lot of the fans have a lot of time to get on Twitter. You know what match I saw there that I found the most intriguing CM Punk versus Wardlow. What's that? Oh, that! Oh, I I forgot about that one. All I hope. Okay, God damn it! Just because the guy says he's the best in the world, do you have to fucking test him every time out? <laughs> he's not Merlin, the fucking magician. Uh, that worries me. That really does. Because I I don't know exactly how that should come together, unless it's some. I don't want to say some angle because if it's a, if it's a match, they're booking, unless it's some conduit to lead to punk and MJF. I'd like to see that maybe, but good Lord. What do you um, think of FTR versus the Lucha brothers for the tag titles? Only if they win the, if, if they do a job for penthouse and Felix, then that will, is that maybe the only team they haven't laid down for in the company? Have they put them over yet? I don't remember seeing that. I don't that. remember either if they have. It'll, sure. it'll be interesting to see if the Lucha Brothers can actually work a, a, an American-style tag match. If they can do that, then I actually think that FTR could have the best match I've seen out of the Lucha Brothers. 
if they if FTR tries to do a bunch of lucha, I think it could fall down the well real quick. What do you think of the match between Cody Rhodes versus anyone who Cody thinks they will actually boo, or as is listed here, Malachi Black, Andrade El Idolo, or Miro. So they don't even know who Cody's <laughs> going to be. Maybe, maybe they could bring Saddam Hussein back. Possibly re-energize oh, Mussolini or Genghis Khan. I don't. Who would they boo now against Cody? I don't know. Genghis Khan might get over with some people, but let me ask yeah. you this: It's this the the, Mon the Mongolian contingent would be there in force because whenever they get one of their guys in a big match, they they fly in the Mongolians. Kenny Omega versus Hangman Page for the title. You surprised they're doing it? No, I, I mean nothing surprises me. Um, and I and actually I'm not surprised they're doing it because they've left it dangling out there, and it's too soon for one of their new acquisitions, but. Boy, howdy, he better not win the thing. If, if again, if Brian Danielson is not the one that takes that belt off Twinkle Toes, then I think they're all crazy. Well, we shall find out <laughs> at AEW Full Gear. Yes, we will. What else has Tony Khan been involved with? Oh, he's smarter than Ted Turner. Have you heard about this? I did not see that quote. Let me try to find that one while you tell me what it is. I have other quotes. I did not see that one. Please. And again, who was it? Jesus. I'm trying to think of who was it and what the quote was, but basically it, it was applied before in, in relation to ECW and Paul Heyman and their, their under their underground movement uh, in the 90s the un the the underground darling the revolution the anti-establishment sooner or later becomes the establishment is tony khan now getting a little too big for his britches and just now a, he's announcing that he's richer than vince mcmahon he's smarter than ted turner He's the booker of the year, and at some point, is there going to be some backlash from people going, even the AEW faithful, like, hold, hold on, cowboy. You, you know, and what do you do in your spare time? Cure cancer? Is he going to be on the next space flight? What? A, well, I mean, he, you know, and, and different things are different things. With the WWE stuff, he's fighting back, and I actually like what he's doing there, so I got no problem yeah, but, with, but, with that. But, but here's the thing. He's... He's just, he's running away with it. When he said, in response to whatever, I can't remember, but he said that he knows more than Ted Turner ever. Ted Turner didn't know 1% of what he knows about here. wrestling. All right, we'll go ahead and read the exact quote then. Well, the exact quote, and to put it in proper context, and again, I'm new to this story. There was an article by Wrestling Inc., and the headline is Backstage Talk on How WWE Feels About Tony Khan Spending Big to keep AEW going. I'm assuming there's some kind of quote in that article comparing him to Ted Turner from the well, WWE yeah, yes, side. Yes, and basically, and it was somewhat of the same response is that they're going to spend and spend and spend until finally it, it collapses. Tony retweeted that and he remarked, I've never met Ted Turner. It's very possible Ted Turner is smarter than me but he didn't know 1% of what I know about professional wrestling or WCW would still be on TNT slash TBS. <laughs> AEW is here to stay. Watch Rampage live tonight on TNT or watch TNT app on your phone or any device. So then it turned into a plug. But I don't see this as a, as a giant shot well, at no, Ted Turner, but, but I also don't see it as completely accurate. If he knew what I knew, it would be no, on the I, air. No, I, I, if he knew what you knew, maybe he wouldn't have fucking made the deal with Time Warner. That's really what... If, that's the thing is, that's what I'm saying. It's not a giant shot at Ted Turner like Ted Turner would give a shit. It's the point is it makes Tony look bad because what Ted Turner knew or didn't know about professional wrestling, Ted Turner could have been fucking Toots Mont 
And Ted Turner could have been Vince Russo. It didn't make any difference because he didn't have a single thing to do with the company on a day-to-day -day basis or any kind of basis, except to, for a photo op every once in a while. It was part of the empire and the people that were running WCW within that empire are the ones that he should be saying, because he did. He probably does know a hundred times more about wrestling than Jim Hurd did. But to to just go and say, well, I'm I'm smarter about wrestling than Ted Turner makes it look like that Ted Turner was running a wrestling company and it makes Tony look like a mark for thinking that. And again, I like Tony fighting back, but but to your point, this does seem defensive for no good reason. Yes, and it is, it's like it's he say he's starting to sound like Uncle Dave when anybody questions his opinions. Um but anyway, he's he's Smarter than Ted Turner, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a basement booker. It's Tony Khan. Slow down, cowboy. You're doing good so far, but don't get in over your head. And by the way, when do the ratings for the programs that we're going to talk about here in a little while, the Friday night showdown this week, when does that come out? It's a weekend. so It may be Monday, gonna, but I'm not sure. If we have to wait till Monday, this will be interesting, but I don't. I don't think it was, you know, a, they tried everything that they could do, and we'll talk about it here in a little while, but I don't think it was going to be a runaway on either side. We'll see what happens. But I think Tony ought to settle down a little bit and not get too much heat on himself because all of his minions like him talking like that. But if he gets too grand, the average people are going to go, all right, this he already is coming off a little fucking markish every time he opens his mouth on an interview because he's got that teenage boy voice and that machine gun delivery about all the markish things that he dreams up to a point but again I, my attitude is you can't say that wwe is not trying to fuck with him and hasn't since the beginning if he's gonna fight back and say comments oh, yeah. like that and by the way they're great comments you want to get under vince's skin i've got more money than you i could do this all day <laughs> and what we have the exact quote we'll get to that in a second but i actually like that i am happy that he's fighting back and doing it the way he is I'm not saying I'm not saying he shouldn't tell Vince he's got more money than he does or his daddy does one or the other. Uh, that's good. I'm saying let's not bring fucking Ted Turner into this and just make it sound like that he's he's making himself sound like he's the grandest television producer of our age suddenly because he's taken advantage at this point of a of a of billionaire that's rapidly becoming more senile by the day. Well, here's a couple other quotes, and apparently this is from an article in the New York Post. Uh, the interviewer is Joseph Stasuski. I, I'm so sorry for what I've just done to your name, Joseph, but I tried. You think Joseph is listening? I think he may. He may say, oh my God, Jim Cornette's going to tear me apart. But uh, there's a couple of questions here. I'll read you the question and the answer. Joseph, our pal Joe, said, referring to that tweet Tony sent out, we talked about the other day about the Friday Night War. The tweet you sent out said it was part of your business plan to recreate this competition. This back-and-forth spirit that was there in the 90s, and here's Tony's answer, in wrestling, we're worth more against each other, and we're better off against each other. I believe there's a greater value in the wrestling market when we're fighting, and people want to see competition in wrestling. I think it's one of the reasons people lost interest in wrestling was because there was not true competition for 20 years. Now, with AEW in the mix and competition back in wrestling, I think there are more people excited about wrestling than there have been in a long time with this free agent movement and good shows. At the end of the day, it has to be good shows. Through the 90s, there were a lot of great wrestling shows. Every week, every month, there would be great stories and great matches, and you couldn't miss it. I think it's starting to get that way again. So before I move on any further, any thoughts on that initial question mm. and answer? Well, part of this is the problem, is that Tony thought the 90s were about great matches and great stories. What didn't he mention there? What didn't he mention? Bueller? What didn't he great, mention? Great stars. He's a fan like the other AEW fans are fans of that attitude era horseshit that we had to sit through the hot shotting and the bullshit and the nonsense that 
that ilk of people believes is what was driving the Attitude Era. What drove the Attitude Era was the competition between the two companies that people believed and knew was real and could see it play it out on TV and the top four or five guys on each fucking side. Austin and Rock, and on the other side, there's fucking, at various fucking points, Goldberg and fucking Hogan and the NWO or whatever. And now people have romanticized, especially Tony Khan has romanticized it. A lot of the fucking booking, especially in the in the WCW, with their bookings what put them out of business, but even in the WWF, remember, it was shit stain in his crash TV. The stories were caca in a lot of cases. The booking was bleh. The matches were shit. But the top four or five guys on each side, their matches, their promos, everything they did was gold because they were big stars and they were over. And that's the reason why Vince won the war because he concentrated on his big stars and didn't let shit stain fuck them up all the way. And on the other side, Nobody was concentrating on all their big stars because each of their big stars in WCW was concentrating on themselves. And then it all went to shit. So Tony has just acknowledged everything about the Attitude Era that you don't want to repeat and nothing about the Attitude Era that you do want to repeat. The stars were what made it hot. The stars were what got it over and the competition between the two companies. Now they've got competition between the two companies and no stars on either side. Just phony bullshit matches that appeal to the, what used to be 10% of the audience that wanted chaos and fucking, you know, just phony shit as long as it's action. That 10% is now the entire wrestling audience. Because we ran all the other ones off with all the phony shit and the lack of stars. I could go on, but I won't. Well, I have some more quotes from Tony. Before I get back to this post interview, I'm going to do this one first because I guess it ties in together. I just am noticing this now. This is from an interview Tony did with Robbie Fox on My Mom's Basement. I guess that's a what? show and it sounds like the target audience as well. But wait a minute now. He's He's got $8 billion. He's appearing on a show called My Mom's Basement. Well, to be fair, I don't know that show. Maybe it's a big show. Maybe it's a show that has a big following. I, I don't know. So Maybe it's a big basement. Maybe it's a big mom. But here's the uh, quote. It's the second time they've decided to go head-to-head -head with us. I want the fans to be able to watch all the wrestling. I'll coin a phrase right now. W-Y-W. -W. Watch your wrestling. I want people to watch your wrestling. Whatever you want to watch, watch it. A lot of people have chosen to watch AEW because it's the best show. Watch your wrestling. I want people to watch everything. It's the second time they've chosen to put their wrestling head-to-head -head with mine. The last time they did it, it didn't happen overnight, but from the start, AEW consistently did better numbers than NXT, and we eventually won that war. And AEW is now the Wednesday night show and Wednesday Night Dynamite has had a great run. On Friday, they're doing a half hour head-to-head -head with Rampage, which is new. I put my show on consciously after SmackDown, knowing there was a huge audience of people that watched that show, and a lot of people are going to watch Rampage, which has been a hit for TNT. They're literally going to do a half hour head-to-head. -head. Oh, good lord! That's fine. We'll see what happens. You know what, you know what Mama Cornette would have said about Tony Khan? He was vaccinated with a phonograph needle. Because she used to say that about me, and he talks more than I do. We'll see what happens. I'm not saying for sure we'll win, and maybe the odds are against us in some ways, but we're going to do the better show. I know. If you don't believe me, watch the go-home Raw show they did last night because it sucked. <laughs> 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 Finally an insult there at the end, but I wanted to read that one first because... He coined this phrase, and then back to the New York Post interview with uh, Big Joe. Joe's question, a lot of the AEW talk during the Wednesday Night Wars was, we concentrated it on ourselves and didn't care what the other company was doing. Does this, again referring to his tweet and I guess recent behavior, go against that? 
And why was this the right time to do something like this? And Tony's response is, it's a little bit different than the Wednesday Night Wars because that was from the very beginning of Dynamite. And we put our head down and it was an every week thing. This seems like pretty predatory, which is fine if that's how you want to play it. It's not outwardly how they've shown they wanted to play it. I've coined the phrase, which is W-Y-W, watch your wrestling. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Whatever people want to watch, I want them to watch it. Unfortunately, if we are on at the same time, it's harder for people to watch their wrestling, at least live. <laughs> we can take commercials out of it. If you want to take the commercials out of it, I can do that too. It doesn't seem very civil, but I have more money than <laughs> they do. See- it doesn't seem very civil to take the commercials out of the show, but I've got more money than they do. So I can afford to do it longer than they can. But that's how we make money at the end of the day. So I was surprised when they took those out. <laughs> what the? <laughs> I love it. I think it's great. Look here. This is. Nobody is being predatory here. They AEW has a show on Friday night at 10 o'clock. WWE has one on Friday nights at 8 o'clock, normally on the Fox network that does four times, or in in the case of the record rating that Punk got when he came back, it still twice, SmackDown does twice what Rampage normally does. But then all of a sudden, SmackDown is switched to a much smaller subsidiary sports channel for a week to where the the numbers if AEW overachieves and overproduces and FS1 does just kind of what it did last time then it'll be a, a bit of a fight so the, the the WWE decides well we'll just go two and a half hours because we don't want to lose even though we're on the equivalent of showing slides on the wall of a barn next to our network slot We'll go 30 minutes over to try to dull their number. And so the other side says, well, we're not going to show any commercials in the first 20 minutes. Well, for the record, WWE did no commercials too. Okay. okay, But the point is none of these things are going to put the other company out of business. And it, it, we're not even talking about bragging rights for two big shows on the same night. Like when the Sheik would run the Kobo in Detroit and Bruiser would run the Olympia and Sheik won with 12,000 people because Bruiser only got 8,000 people. It's a, it's a fucking fight between a show on Friday night at 10 o'clock on TNT and a show on FS1. It, it, it's, it, yeah, and they're bringing the fight to him. I mean, it is predatory in that way. And if he's not going to take it, he's going to immediately fight back and make it public. I think that's great. Let them know. Uh, Public I'm just saying it's not, it's not like anybody's going to be run out of business over this, and it's not the biggest bragging rights that anybody's ever had for either side. You protect your real estate. It's not about bragging rights. He's there. And they're saying, oh, let's fuck with... We, we can't risk the idea that <laughs> AEW would beat us in one night in the demos. We can't risk that. So let's run a half hour with no commercials. And Tony said, yeah, all right, I could do that too. You know, I mean, I think he's doing just fine here. They're going to fuck with him. They're going to be passive aggressive about it. They're going to pretend like they're not publicly. He's going to go the other way and publicly say, yeah, they're doing it. And I can do it too. And I think that's, that's what WWE needs. They need someone to fucking take it right to them. Uh, well, but they're, they're, this is a pie fight at best. I'm not disagreeing because... with you. It's Friday nights. Let's see when it's a Monday night fight. Let's see when it's a Sunday night fight. Let's well, see let's see when else. it's actually on, you know, cable against cable in a, a appropriate matchup or network or something rather than fs1 i'm but i'm gonna i'm gonna say this i believe that the wwe will still beat rampage by 150,000 viewers or more let's see what happens you know what i don't know the last time they were preempted and sent to fs1 what was on that they got preempted i mean this was a big baseball game red Sox and astros game one i don't know what it's been previously because this Traditionally, a game like this, if it was on another channel during a wrestling show, would take a chunk of the audience away. I don't know what the previous times they were moved and, you know, where they got a million plus people, what they were actually up against. So this is the World Series? No, this is not. This is the American League Championship Series. Ah, but there's more than one game of the, you said game one. Game one. It's a best of seven series and it's a best of seven series in the National League. 
and those two winners will play in the World Series. Well, good for them. But anyway, I still say SmackDown on FS1 by 150,000 people. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. What do you think? I'm crazy, Brian? I I don't want to say that. I wouldn't want to hurt your feelings. You, no, do you think I'm I'm mentally demented that I've lost the plot? I would never say that to you. Why are you, you saying so you you are coming out and saying to me just flat out, Jim Cornette, you're nuts. That's what you're saying. Well, hey, that's a good thing. Maybe I am saying that. Well, everybody wants to be nuts because of our friends at nuts.com because they have they've gone crazy lately. Have you seen all the people on Twitter? They're tweeting the the bags of white chocolate toffee cashews, and they're tweeting the boxes that are being delivered from Nuts.com because, of course, they are the best-kept secret of savvy snackers around the country. See how I did that? <laughs> they're not just for Nuts lovers anymore, folks. If you're, a, if you're a lover of Nuts, if you like to put them in your mouth and suck on them, kiss them, Loll them around over your tongue, whatever the case. It's not just nuts at nuts.com. It's an incredible variety of snacks and pantry items, candies, dried fruits, baking mixes, pasta, dried fruit, flowers, grains, and all the raw, organic, roasted, salted, and candied nuts that you could imagine in your wildest dreams. If you eat something at night and it gives you nightmares and you're dreaming about the giant nut monsters that are eating you, They've got even more stuff like that at nuts.com. It's a nut it's monsters. a children's nightmare. No, stop saying that. There are no yeah, nut no, monsters. I'm, I'm telling you, if don't don't let the kids be anywhere around this stuff because it'll give them nightmares because it's so good. It's so fresh. It's so exciting. They will have wonderful dreams of dancing nuts as well as other things like dried fruit in their head. That's, no nightmares. That's right. With visions of sugar plums that are all dried out and dancing in their heads. <laughs> and then Christmas morning will come. Anyway, oh, nuts.com has gluten-free and vegan options. No, it's a family-run business that takes pride in getting you the freshest items available. Delivery is fast. Most orders ship the same day you make them, so stuff gets there fresher than the supermarket. As I mentioned, a bunch of the Cult of Cornet members have remarked on how fast it is, how fresh they are, and how tasty they are. And now you can have healthy and uh, 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 nutritious nuts pipelined to your home and for cheap. All you got to do is text EXPERIENCE to 64000. That's the word EXPERIENCE, E-X-P-E-R-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, to 64000. That's six four with three zeros behind it. Text EXPERIENCE to 64000 and you will get free shipping. On your first order from nuts.com, they will send this stuff to you absolutely free of shipping charges, ladies and gentlemen. And their prices are so low that the stuff you're going to get is worth twice as much as you're going to pay anyway. So text experience to 64,000 and hug your nuts close to you because the folks at nuts.com are going to give you these things for a fraction of what you would pay anywhere else. Terms apply. Available at nuts.com slash terms. Well, we've got to send our congratulations out also to William Shatner, who this past week became the oldest person ever to be shot into space. But against the urgings and pleadings of the rest of his cast of Star Trek, they actually let him splash back down. What do you think? Now, a member of the WWE Hall of Fame has been shot into space. Who needs to be the next one? Oh, I can think of a few that could be shot into space, but hopefully not for a return visit. But William Shat, what do you think of this? What do you, we haven't talked about this at all, but it's been a big thing and something that a lot of shareholders are talking about, whether they want to invest in this field or not. And it's getting a lot of coverage. It's a, talking about billionaires earlier, it's a space race now. What are your thoughts on space tourism? <laughs> I've got a whole list. I've been jotting them down as they came to my mind of who I would like to see, I might even chip in on some people to, uh, to get them a ride on this thing. Uh, I'm just, I'm concerned that it seems to be too safe and they, they keep coming back quickly. The ones, the ones that I would nominate for space vacations would be ones that I would want to see take a one-way trip. But 
would you want to go into space unless you were a lifelong member of NASA and an astronaut that specifically wanted to get in this field and do this? Would you just want to go into space just because Aunt Gladys can buy a ticket to go into space now? First of all, it sounds like Aunt Gladys has done well for herself, so I want to congratulate her. But I mean, again, it's not space exploration. It's space tourism. You go up, you come right back down. It's pretty quick. Maybe you do. So far, they have. So far. And again, if it was safe and I was convinced it was safe and I don't bungee jump or anything, so I would really have to be con- you know, convinced <laughs> it was safe, then it sounds like it'd be great to be up there for a little bit and come back down. Sounds like a wonderful Be adventure. up there for a little bit and then come back down. Yeah. That's what I'm afraid of every time I take a, an airplane. I'll be up there for a little while and then come back down, possibly sooner than intended. I don't, the, y'all can have it. I'll be over here. I, you know, here's the thing. I grew up on the original Moon Project, on the original Apollos. You were on that film set? I, no, God. Oh, <laughs> on that film. I just got that a um, no, but I, I saw in live, actually live broadcast, the landing on the moon. That was a big thing. We stayed up for it. I was July 96, nine. I was almost eight. I was in the high sevens at the time. My mother bought me the eight millimeter film, which was the only thing you could have video in your home at the time of the moon landing. We were studying all that stuff in school. My best friend for grades one through three, before he moved out of town, he loved rockets and we learned about Werner von Braun and the the rocket program and the space program and his manager Saul Weingroff and his manager Saul Weingroff yes down there that's where the von Braun Civic Center in Huntsville came from the most famous German in Huntsville Alabama was Werner von Braun but anyway um yeah it was a big deal when I was a kid and I was disheartened when they they gave up the space program what in the early 70s mid 70s I can't remember exactly the year When I was a kid, I had a telescope I used to put out in the driveway. We were far enough out from town back then that you actually had dark skies at night. And you could look at the the constellations and etc. But I I never, even then, I wanted people to go into space, trained professional astronauts to go into space and take better pictures and find out all the shit that was going on and come and report back. I was anxiously awaiting their findings, but I didn't, even when I was watching Lost in Space and I thought, oh, it'd be cool to have the robot and, and a friend like Dr. Smith. I didn't that, want to hold on, on stop, that. stop. That was your thought? It would be cool to have the robot and a friend like Dr. Smith? <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to oh, dear there. Jimmy, come here. Oh. When I hey, my my father, I remember he hated Doctor Smith. He was still alive when Doctor Smith was on. <laughs> he would leave the room when Doctor Smith. Oh my aching! I used to go around when I was nine. My back is a disaster area today, mother. All the kids um, on the playground. I wish I had a friend like Davy Jones. I wish I had a friend like Batman. Yeah. I wish I was friends with Doctor Zachary Smith. Doctor Zachary yeah. Smith. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it was, you know, space was on my mind, but I didn't want to go there. I wanted, I wanted somebody to go and find out all the things that needed to be found out and come back and report back to everybody. You think you would have felt any different about it if you had been 10 years older and grown up during the era of science fiction comics more than superhero comics? Um, no, because I, I read the 50s science fiction comics in the 60s and I loved them didn't make me want to go out in space. Because even when I was watching Lost in Space, I was like, you know, there's probably some shit on that planet I wouldn't want to mess with. And then out of something, a bog or a fog (laughs) or smog or a hole in the ground comes that goddamn big furry fucking creature with one eye and a horn on its head, and I'm vindicated. I'm, I'm right. There is some shit on that planet I don't want to fuck with. But you got a robot and Dr. Smith. So I got a robot and I got Dr. Smith to protect me. You've never ever. Danger, danger, Will Robinson. So even when you were a kid, you've never fantasized about going to the moon or going up into outer space or going to Martin. Nothing ever. No, because it appeared to me at the time to be dangerous. 
<laughs> and I've always been a rather level-headed person. Yeah, oh yeah, no, dangerous. I'm, I'm, I'm not like falling over a scaffold. Should... Yeah, no, that's not. Well, dangerous. that was that was that was only twenty feet and for money, and, <laughs> and, and it was wrestling, and people were watching it on television. But no, but no, for the big stuff like shooting yourself into fucking outer space. Uh, no, I've never been tempted or or tantalized by the prospect of that because I thought, you know, that that's probably dangerous. Is there any single thing you could think of that could happen to convince you that space travel, let alone regular jet travel, is safe? Is there anything that could just take all of your problems with it away? Or is it just, nope, there's nothing that could ever be done. This is a dangerous thing I don't want to have anything to do with. There is one thing that could be done to get me on the next space flight. And that's for someone that I trust to come out and announce that, ladies and gentlemen, the world's going to blow up at noon on Tuesday, and the last rocket is leaving at 10 a.m. I'll be on that motherfucker. So that's interesting. So you're willing to do it to flee. That's the only way you would consider leaving Louisville (laughs) in a rocket is to to flee. You could have said that's the only way you'll consider leaving the planet Earth, but that's the only way you consider leaving Louisville. Yeah, actually, that's the best way to say it. I will leave Louisville when somebody <laughs> announces that the world is going to blow up next Tuesday and I need to be on the last rocket at 10 o'clock in the morning. That's when I'm leaving. But I but it, I think we should we should throw this open to the members of the cult. Who would you like to see? I guess we'll just leave it to the wrestling world because i mean the entire world anybody in the world it'd be too easy obviously our repugnant failed former president should be the first person to be cast off and exiled into space but if we keep it to the wrestling community should it be the entire group of deathmatch assholes should it be shit stain should it be the collective wwe writing staff that puts all these improper imprudent words in the mouths of the talent who should it be we'll, we'll take That's suggestions right. how about a yenta who looks like a garbage pail kid it, what does he drool that, that may be him yeah maybe him well see then, that, then that, automatically then we're talking about creating a, some kind of international space incident <laughs> a new species like that like that south park <laughs> episode where the the space police are going to come and say Instead of they're looking, they're not looking for baby farts, McGee Zacks. They're they're coming to talk to us because we started a space incident by blasting off uh, the orange Mussolini into the uh, into the outer galaxies. Anyway, we can only hope. <sighs> this past week was another episode of Dark Side of the Ring, and this episode was on Luna Vashon. And I'd been waiting to see this because I always liked Luna and I wasn't, you know, I I honestly, and again, this is, I guess it's my fault because I don't really just ask people about their personal lives. I fear if they're going to bring it up, it's my business and I'll listen. But if not, I'm, and I don't, you know, volunteer problems because I don't see why, you know, people maybe want to hear my problems or whatever, unless you. I bitch at you all the time. But I always liked Luna. I always liked working with Luna. I always thought she was a great talent. I knew she had issues both with drugs and with depression, but I didn't know the extent of both until I saw this episode. And, you know, I thought Medusa did a great job. She's so well-spoken and just level-headed. And, I, you know, uh, Dave Heath Gangrel, her Luna's ex-husband, and, you know, Penelope Paradise hadn't seen her in 30 years. Just people that knew Luna and were around her. Uh, it was a it was a nice look, not only at her, not a nice look, I shouldn't say that, but you know, it was a, a deep look, not only at her career, but also her as a person. What'd you think, Brian, before I drone on too much longer? You know, I think also, and I know it's not one of the more high profile ones, but just like with the Bruiser Bedlam one, I think this was one of the better dark sides and i kind of think although there were splashier topics in earlier seasons i think as filmmakers they've done some better work this season and i thought they've also had some some of the right voices i thought gangrel was great here and he seemed to be very honest and open about things 
Her son, who apparently is a culinary celebrity of some sort. Yeah, yeah, he was on Hell's Kitchen a couple of seasons ago. He, I mean, it was very interesting to hear what he had to say. I mean, his reaction when Dick Slater's brought up. And you hear him say, well, I heard all these stories about abuse, but I never saw it. I never even saw them fight. So it's interesting to finally hear that perspective. Um, you know, they tackled the, I guess we'll just call it incestuous abuse slightly in this. and. I was curious how they would handle that because I don't want to say anything because you don't know what's true and what isn't, but there have always been stories coming out of especially that South Florida crew, wrestlers and smart fans who were friends with Luna and knew her. There were different stories out there about different things, and I'm glad at least some area of that was addressed, although it may have been something they could have addressed further or gone deeper on, but again, it was only 40-something minutes. Well, and also it was only 40 something years ago and you, you tend with so many of the people involved are not around anymore. Do you, do you bring in, in, in other episodes, they brought up stories that were a long time ago, but there were still people that were kind of on the scene or involved in the thing where it was with this, almost nobody that would have been there at that time or nobody is, is still around. Um, and how old is Butcher Vashon these days? He has to it, be in his eighties, I would think. I would think, and and I guess he's had ill health. Has he had his his voice was rough? Has he had an issue with cancer, or it just? I didn't see a box or anything, but I thought he was speaking with some help, but I wasn't sure. Look how look up how old he's got because he's got to be. Mad Dog was in the forty eight Olympics. Which would Mad Dog today would be ninety is ninety something. Butcher's got to be in his late eighties. Um, and that story that he told about how I honestly, I'd always heard that Luna was Butcher Vashon's daughter. I didn't know that he was a stepdaughter. That he was that she was a stepdaughter. And the story that he told of marrying. The woman who was running the motel he was staying at in Atlanta, because Butcher Vashon was a big deal in Atlanta in the 60s. But he married the woman that was running the hotel after her husband shot herself while he was staying at that hotel, and then he ended up adopting Luna. That's a bizarre story in itself. 84 years old. So he was that much younger than Mad Dog. That's it. And Mad, But he was also... What, a hundred pounds bigger and a foot taller than Mad Dog, too. And still wasn't the toughest brother. Yeah, I was yet. about to say, Mad Dog would have still kicked his ass. What did you think of the Moolah stuff? I mean, the more and more that comes out about Moolah, and I had never heard the story about Moolah and Luna before. Maybe it was out there and I just didn't know it. What did you think of that? Well, it, part of, again, um, Mad Maxine or Lady Maxine was one of the ones who was one of the moolah naysayers and detractors before. So it's the same kind of story. Um, I had not heard that specifically that happened to Luna, but that was the deal is that not only would, you know, the girls get booked to wrestle, but also the girls would get booked out to do photo shoots or whatever the case. And what went on apparently was, was up to them or whether what they could get it, get out of. And, I had never heard that about Luna. Uh, apparently, she forcefully declined the, you know, the 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 booking once she got there. But again, that brings up the whole thing about Moolah because you had people that would the girls that would that worked with her that would defend her and and die a million deaths for her, and then you had also yet other girls that had nothing good to say and had rotten experiences. So who the fuck knows, right? But the point is, is that Luna had not only, she wanted to prove something and she, she loved wrestling. We say that so much about everybody, but she loved wrestling, wanted to be in the business, but she also had that to prove that she belonged. She was a member of the Vashon family because they were so famous in the business. and then. She had to deal with that. I mean, you saw the old pictures of her. She's a very pretty girl. And 
you know, when she was in a swimsuit or something like that, if, and if she wasn't made up with giant, you know, skulls drawn on her head, she was attractive, but she wasn't like one of the models, the, the, the diva area, the saber era, the sables and all that. She wanted to be a wrestler and like, if they likened her to Sherry Martell. She was actually, I've worked with both actually wrestled both in matches and Sherry was good, but Luna was better. Luna was probably one of the premier, if not the premier female worker, just in, in pro wrestling style of, of her day. You've and, never said that. I've never heard you or anyone say that before. And not that I'm doubting it, but I'm fascinated if you could break that down a little more. Cause everyone always points to Sherry as being like the woman during that era who can go in there and wrestle a Jim Cornette and go in there and do great at ringside and do all these things. Why was Luna to you better than Sherry in the ring? <sighs> Sherry had trained with Moolah and did a lot of the stuff that Moolah did, including one of the things that Moolah, for whatever reason, was loose with <laughs> was the girls would do right-sided headlocks and the girls would work the right side a lot instead of the left sometimes or switch back and forth. And when I worked with Sherry, actually, fuck, <laughs> Sherry did that to me. I turned around for her to grab me in a headlock takeover, and she grabbed me in the right with the right arm, and I was going to the left side, and we kind of went. I went down on my knees, and I said, "Other side, please." <laughs> um, <clears throat> but with, uh, Sherry was a great bumper. Sherry was a wonderful promo and a, and a great worker with the exuberance and everything to manage a ringside. And Sherry had good matches with the girls. She never got to work. I don't think hardly any of the guys, I was a manager, so that didn't, and I had one spot show match with her up North uh, one time. Um, but Luna worked just like the guys and could work with the guys. And she not only, well, like what we did, it wasn't an intergender match meant to be taken seriously and competitively. I'll tell you what it was. It was, it was a show up in Connecticut. There was a guy that owned a variety of sports card collectible shops in those big malls up there. And that's where I, he was booking Austin for 20, 25 grand and booking all these big names and, and the top guys. And, and I was in charge of booking third-party promotions at that point. So um, the the autograph sessions did so well. He said, hey, I've got connections out here in eastern Connecticut with high schools and sponsoring groups, and I can get publicity. How about we run wrestling shows? Okay. So I couldn't get the Austins and the Rocks and the top guys. They wouldn't let them, even in those days, work third parties, but I was getting the guys that weren't booked all the time you know, Billy Gunn or Test or, you know, the the middle card guys that had open dates. And that's during a period of time Luna was there. So I did one of these shows for the guy and I would book the card, run the locker room. And instead of just giving me a payoff, he'd cut me in on if it did well, you know, the old wrestling theory, right? Only this guy was legitimate. Some of his high school shows in those small eastern towns in Connecticut did 1,500 or 2,000 people. The one with Luna definitely was, it was sold slap dab out. And I would make more money just booking the show and running the locker room for him that I'd make working for Vince in two weeks. So, yeah. Because, I mean, he was charging, if he did 2,000 people and charged 15, 20, 25 for a ticket, whatever, right? <clears throat> so anyway, on one of them, Luna was available, but we didn't have another girl. And I asked her, I said, hey, Luna, you want to make this $500 shot plus trance? Sure. You want to work with me? Because I got to figure out a way to get my name on the card because they know me. I'm on TV. So we'll have a fucking match. Okay. I can't do her voice. And the thing is, she was so smart to the business. She knew how to work with me. I'm a manager. So even though back then I was, that was the year I was 270. So I was twice her weight. And almost a foot taller, but I'm a fat fucking dumpy manager that can't do anything right. And we got to put in 15 minutes or so counting the entrances and, and well, and, and then I'm going to do a little promo, but we get, we did old Southern spot show spots where the baby face makes an idiot out of the heel. 
and we did a few manager spots. I channeled Bobby Heenan. She understood every, we went over it ahead of time in the locker room because we'd never worked before and we're never going to work again, but it's not like we had to spend two hours on it because she knew these spots. And it, it's just, it's working and it's just getting the people involved. It's a high school show out of 2000 people, 500 of them were under 18 at least. So make them all happy. <clears throat> and it tore the house down because everything tore the house down. They'd never seen the fucking live stars before there. So, <laughs> but it, that's what I'm saying is that she was easy to work with because she could work like one of the guys and she had been to so many territories and she'd had so many different kind of matches. She spent so much time, especially in Florida, where they did a lot of this stuff, that she knew all the spots and she knew, you know, I mean, I'm getting heat on her so she can make her big comeback. I'm getting the heat on her with the, you know what the ice clamp is, a.k.a. the lazy man's hold, a.k.a. the fucking nerve hold uh, that Jimmy Valiant used to use in <laughs> the last 20 years of his career. You just fucking get a hole, the Spock pinch on, on somebody's shoulder and they sell it. And that's all I'm doing. She's selling her ass off for it. Right. So the point is she was a very good all around performer in wrestling. And she didn't get the opportunity in that era of the WWF to show it. And as they mentioned, either today in AEW or WWE, well, my guess she'd, she'd be, you can't tell me that anybody thinks that Luna wasn't a better worker, a better in-ring talent than Bianca Belair, Sasha, Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, Britt Baker. I mean, she was as good as, as many of the guys. So she would have been one of the top girls in the business now where they're letting them wrestle and work. And unfortunately... <laughs> they're letting them wrestle and work for the ones that can really do it. That's a benefit. And for, unfortunately, the, you know, the ones that really can't, that's detrimental to the viewer. But she would have been one of the top girls in the business today. Whatever happened to that Connecticut promoter? I came back to Louisville and, and uh, I bet he got out of the wrestling business because nobody would book him talent. As a matter of fact, that last show, I can't remember the last one I did for him. I can't remember whether it was the match with Luna or whether it was something right after that. But I'd moved to Louisville to start with OVW, and I drove back up there to make sure that the show came off because he had always taken care of me and paid me so well. And, uh, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't leave him false advertising. So I drove wow. back to Connecticut for that fucking show. But as I mentioned, I'd make as much in one night when he turned them away at the door as I did working for Vince for two weeks and didn't have to go to a fucking office. All I had to do was work with Luna. Good episode though. And, uh, you know, I thought they told the story. Well, it's a sad story because of so many different circumstances, but I felt myself watching it and wanting to go back and watch some Luna footage. And I remember that first time she came out, first time I saw her as a kid, WrestleMania nine, which she comes out with Shawn Michaels that exaggerated walk and her face is turned. I'd never <laughs> seen anything like that before. And they showed her body slamming Sherry on the floor. And right now, maybe you see that and it's like blase. That was a big deal. We never saw fucking women take body slams on the floor and wrestling on TV. You didn't see that many men taking body slams <laughs> yeah, on the floor. That's in those right. Days. Not on that roster. Yeah, and 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 that and they showed the footage where, I mean, she she bred hearted sable in that match sable playing the part of tom mcgee that's the only time that i can remember that sable out of me and of course they showed the clips of the best looking stuff because it was still sable wrestling but it wasn't as as complete of an expose of the business and it didn't look as phony as anything else that sable ever did because luna did a great job for her. what did you think about the idea vince said to her if she has any bruises or anything you're fired well, that was... Did that surprise you? Or do you believe that? Or what are well, your thoughts on that? No, hold on, hold on. I don't think that Vince walked up to Luna in the in the hallway one day and led with, and if there's any bruises or scratches on her, you're fired. I think that the, the context of that possibly or probably was in a... 
longer length talk that Vince had about he, they knew that there was issues because Sable was such a fucking twat to everybody except the two Vinces and maybe anybody in production like Bruce or whatever, because she considered them important. But I mean, they told the story and you saw the, the attitude that she had with most people. I don't want to learn how to do this. I don't give a shit. I don't care. I don't want to be, I'm just going to, she's going to go do movies or whatever. So that's why the other girls, because here's this, I mean, in any field or endeavor, when you have someone that not only has not one iota of talent for the respective field that you're talking about, nor the inclination to learn and is simply using it as a way to make a fucking lot of money and become a celebrity, if you are a person in that field who is talented and being overlooked because the two people in charge of this have a schoolgirl fantasy crush on this plastic silicone enhanced you know matchbox car of course you're going to resent it and it was it, it's not like it hasn't happened that way in wrestling with the guys the ultimate warrior everybody resented him for the same reason it's a big daddy in england everybody resented him because of the same reason and he's the promoter's brother whatever um so it's not like that's a surprise and I would imagine that Vince was probably saying, look, you need to do your job and make sure that, you know, we've got an investment here. We don't want any, you know, extracurricular activities outside the ring, or we don't want anything going on inside the ring because Sable would have been completely defenseless. So that's where he probably couched it in. We don't want anything to happen, Luna. Okay. Because they all knew if, if she'd have wanted to, she'd have ripped her fucking throat out what'd you think of the luna sunny story well and that's the one i was trying to remember last week because i knew it it involved luna throwing somebody in an equipment case sunny came up and tried to talk to her about because she knew she was hot and that's when they got into it so she threw sunny in the equipment case and Sonny's like, what did i do but it was just it, you know luna fit in in wrestling locker rooms because everybody was one of the boys there wasn't that many women in the territory days, so she could be featured, even if, maybe if not as a wrestler, but she could be featured and didn't have to worry about an entire gaggle of these blonde lingerie models that suddenly took over the business that she felt was looking at her sideways in the locker room. And, you know, she didn't like to put up with it. I mean, again, it would have been no big deal in the territory days, hey, the girls got in a fight and one of them threw the other one in the equipment case. Ha, oh, shit. Well, I guess we ought to talk to them. But once it got to be the WWF and it's the big leagues and big budget and publicly traded later on, whatever the fuck, nobody can have any fun anymore. You can't throw anybody, you can't duct tape anybody naked to a goddamn railing when the doors are ready to be open and the fans are coming in. No, you can't. No, you see, can't. it's no fun at all. But anyway. So I think that's, you know, but that, that was the, the problem. that They hit that pretty much on the head. She could have been so much more integral a part of the business, but the biggest promotion at the time was marginalized the real women attractions. Now they push anybody that looks good in a fucking pair of tights. Back then it was almost impossible to get to get used unless – one of the two Vinces had a schoolgirl crush on you. Considering they used a photo of you with the unmasked Blackhearts, <laughs> do you think the Blackhearts with Luna could have gone further as a team? Um, I think Tom Nash was was little, maybe cra crazy as a rainbow trout in a car wash. Um, I don't think the team, Gangrel always was sold on as a talent, as a team or as a single or whatever. The Blackheart's gimmick was fine. I think he may have been the loose nut behind the wheel. That picture of us, I know exactly when that was taken. Because in 1990, WCW ran three or four days in Florida. And one of the days in the middle of that was in the Bahamas. And I've told this story before where me and the Midnight Express decided, said, because Stan had worked Florida, and he'd been to the Bahamas, and I'd heard about the Bahamas. Bobby had never been to the Bahamas, never worked Florida. He'd go to the 
gates of hell, right? But we knew that this was going to be a mess and it was going to be dangerous and Stan wasn't going to go. And I said, well, I'm not going to go. Bobby, what? Oh, we better go. <laughs> God damn it. Well, so anyway, Stan somehow got caught in traffic and ended up visiting a young lady that he knew in Florida. I got caught in traffic on the way to the airport to fly to the Bahamas and ended up going to dinner with Jeff Bowdrin and Dave Heath and Tom Nash and maybe another <laughs> friend or two of theirs that night. And Bobby went to the Bahamas and had rocks thrown at him and cups of piss and wrestled outdoors in a ring full of mud and had to walk through the fucking parking lot of the hotel in the arena with all the people booing and throwing things at him. And he said it was a goddamn clusterfuck and you know, it was whatever the fuck it was. And, uh, but that's when that picture was taken in front of their, in front of my hotel stairway when they dropped me off. That's why there were bricks in the background. Yeah, I mean, I mean her and the black car, her and Gangrel together. I liked her and and uh, Goldust when they made Goldust really weird. Imagine that in hindsight when Goldust was really weird. Um. You know, she she fit in a variety of ways. She could wrestle, but she was also a great personality in the corner, and she could be with main event guys, and that would have given her more longevity. It just didn't – it wasn't the right timing. It's amazing. They had Medusa, or Alundra Blaze. They had Luna. They had Sherry, Bull Nakano around that period of time, and, you know, they just kind of was start and stop with whatever they did with the women, and as the thing showed – Luna was more of a valet the entire time she was there than ever a wrestler. Well, and there wouldn't have been anything wrong with that either, except that she wasn't used as a valet manager to the level that Sherry was. And I think she could have been. But anyway, and, and, and honestly, I mean, you know, I'm a big fan of Charlotte Flair's. I think Rhea Ripley ought to be making movies. I'm liking Becky Lynch because she's got that accent and he's just so, so snotty as a heel. She's got an accent, not that it's, one. It still doesn't sound like her when I do that. No. But I'm sorry, you're still limited as a, as a as a female wrestler. You have a shorter career window than the guys do, and you have fewer chances to be in the main events of the big shows. Whereas if you're an integral part of a main event guy's presentation, you will be in that corner in the main events on pay-per-view, the big money matches, whatever, and you got more longevity because if you can do that successfully with one person, you can do it with a number of people, and that gives you more years than just a wrestler. So I still think the best personalities in, on the women's roster should always be affiliated with one of the guys. It's kind of your Leo Rush argument. Well, and now see now you're knocking the girls and saying no. I'm comparing them to Leo Rush. When you said that you don't care if he's a good wrestler or not, you saw that there was money to be made with him as a manager, and there's longevity there, and you could really be a star, and that's how you can get into the main event at WrestleMania. Well, I mean, it's yeah. the same argument. But don't be a mental case and retire every third Tuesday like Leo Rush. Maybe it was all an act because he's been dealing with all these leveraged buyouts. This is some sort of scheme to cause the other party and these buyouts to react. Boy, I wish we had a sponsor that was selling stocks and we'd really have a good transition there. But since we don't, what about a programming note? Um, yeah. For our programs, there was, there's, by the way, there's no NXT review on the program uh, that we're doing right now Thank because God. there wasn't anything worth watching. Holy Christ, I just read the recap. I said, I don't even recognize those names. And then uh, this week's drive through coming out just a few days, we'll talk about the Saturday night. AEW special uh, episode of Dynamite, as well as the newest episode of Roads to the Rotten. And we'll also have questions, songs, and a variety of frivolity. And then next week on the Jim Cornette Experience, this fine program, we're going to have thoughts on the crown jewel. I'm not saying I'm going to watch the whole thing because it's, it's on the cock. It's on the cock. And the cock doesn't have on-screen fast-forward. So I want to see Lesnar and Reigns. We'll see whatever else they do. And we'll have more uh, as well next week on the program. Um, 
When is the big Halloween Havoc special on NXT where they're going to put Steiner over for the title? Ooh, I don't know. I would guess maybe around... That's the, the 27th. I was going to say around the time of Halloween, maybe? What? <laughs> you got a firm grasp of the obvious there, pal. <laughs> uh, so we'll probably, we'll watch that, see what, see what happens, like we don't know what's going to happen. But anyway, did I, did I get all of our programming updates? Yes, those are the updates as of now. Boy, I tell you what, with all these programs we're going to watch brian and all these programs we're going to record and all these notes we're going to be taking we need to get our rest we really need to make sure that we have a good night's sleep why wait why not lay down right now it seems like the perfect time to take a nap well you know i'm within reach of my helix sleep mattress so i could just lay down right now you're saying right and i could just well, not on yes. Mike, not on the air and not on Mike. I'm saying maybe after we're done, you can go lay down over there. Oh, I got I got to I got to wait till we're finished. All right. Well, folks, you will not want to finish whatever you're doing. If you have a Helix sleep mattress, you'll want to be on it 24 hours a day. You will not want to move off the Helix sleep mattress because you know what they say. There have been over one billion hours slept on the Helix mattresses. Did you hear about this, Brian? I thought that's what Wilt Chamberlain used to say. No, no, no. That was a different number entirely. They oh. have figured this out. They've computed this. There's over 1 billion hours that have been slept on Helix mattresses. Now, that's just sleep. Now, when you also, you combine, well, the stuff that Wilt Chamberlain was talking about, we've mentioned if 1 billion hours, how often, let's see, if you sleep 8 hours, how long would you say the average person fucks? I would say that that's not in the copy. And of course, you could fuck or not fuck on a beautiful Helix sleep mattress. It doesn't well, matter. It's they don't discriminate. Do, but I'm just thinking if, if the average pro, well, like, for example, let's say five to seven minutes. So if you sleep eight hours and you fuck five minutes, then there has to be at least 50 million hours fucked on Helix mattresses. And now then what about eating? Do you eat in bed, Brian? I do not know. You don't eat in bed at all. You don't snack. When I, you when I was younger. ice cream at night in front of the TV. When I was younger and I had an apartment, not a home, I did. But now that oh, I have a home. come on. I don't What's about, I, now that you own your home and you own everything. If I'm going to take a snack. Shots, if I'm going to take a snack to the executive floor, am I going to go lay in bed or am I going to sit at my desk? I bring it to the desk. I'll eat at the no, desk. put it at the desk. No, you put that tray on the bed. And you lay across sideways there and you're looking at the at the TV, at the cellular vision, and you're eating on your mattress as well. So and and you you eat because I'm telling you right now, and also in hotels too, you do nothing but eat on the bed. But if well, you're, I've done that, actually for the record, I've done that. Well, there you go. Well, thank you. Someone else's so, bed I'll eat on, not my own. Oh, for heaven's sake. I'm I'd rather eat on my own bed. I know where it's been and who's been on it. But anyway. For five to seven minutes. So yeah, yeah, there you go. And then eight hours. So if you, <laughs> if you sleep for eight hours and you fuck for five to seven minutes and it takes you 20 minutes to eat, well, not yet. And, and besides what else is there in the world besides eating and sleeping and fucking working? The only time that you get off your mattress is to go to work. So you have to have a good quality mattress, like a Helix mattress. And if you're a prostitute or a porn star, what? You don't get off the mattress to go to work. You're working on the mattress. So for prostitutes and porn stars, they literally spend 24 hours a day on their Helix Sleep mattress. But that's and not that's how it why, works. No, of course it is. 24 they hours? There, they sleep there, they fuck there, and they work there. And if you'd like to eat and sleep and fuck where you work, folks, get a Helix Sleep mattress. You go on the the website helixsleep.com that by the way is h e l i x helixsleep.com slash j c e by the way you take the two minute sleep quiz they match you to a customized mattress that you can eat sleep fuck and work on and then they'll deliver it to you you don't even have to go out and pick it up you don't even have to be walking down the interstate with a mattress strapped to your back where everybody knows you're a prostitute or a porn star <laughs> They've got a 10-year warranty, so if any time in the next 10 years it fucks up from being either eaten on, slept on, worked on, or fucked on, they'll give you your money back on it, 
10 years now. Most of us probably won't even live that long. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. The only risk would be if you're having the unprotected sex when you're either fucking or working. Otherwise, there's no risk at all. They've even got financing options, flexible payment plans, almost as flexible as the porn stars that swear by these HelixSleep.com mattresses. And right now they're offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners right at HelixSleep.com slash JCE, up to $200 off a mattress. You could actually pay for the prostitute that you could have come over to work on the mattress that you've just bought oh before you both have a good meal. It's for so the whole anyway, family, ladies and gentlemen, for the whole, the whole family. family no, 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 don't bring the whole It's for the whole family. No, the mattress. bring the whole family in to have no. sex with the hooker before you go and eat on the bed and then go to sleep and then go to work. Oh, go to Helix, helixsleep.com slash JCE. And get all this money and free pillows and stuff and, and a great mattress that you can have a variety of activities, both sporting and others. On They've got 12,000 five-star reviews. That's for the mattress, not for the sex. But For, uh, for the it, record, I don't think porn stars supply their own mattresses. I don't think you usually see a porn well, star lugging would. a mattress onto the set. <laughs> Why wouldn't they supply their own? They know where that one has been. They don't know who's been on the communal mattress before them. That's a good point. That's a very See, good point. well, Helix sells you new mattresses. Nobody have been on these things before. And you are it's up to you to figure out who you're going to let on this thing and what they're going to do while they're there. Helixsleep.com Slash J-C-E There you go. There we go. All right, should we get into the Friday night festivities the uh the head-to-head or uh, parts partially head-to-head matchup beginning with our favorite show smackdown Ugh. on friday october 15th oh god they made it two and a half hours at least we don't have to use our vcrs anymore because i would be wearing my heads out with the speed search you know that on-screen speed search bad for your heads they have managed to even make me completely disinterested in people that normally I would be interested in because either they're presenting them in conjunction with morons or they're making them all morons with all this scripted shit. I'm talking about Edge and Rollins. I've, I still like Edge as a talent, as a worker. I like Seth as a worker and I'd love to see him actually cut some promos instead of trying to become a Shakespearean thespian, but this whole Edge and Rollins thing, it's the first, I don't know how long this segment was, but they recapped the home invasion, quote unquote, and Edge comes out and sits down. It was like the South Park wrestling episode, the, the WTF Federation. He sits in the chair, he delivers scripted verbiage and acts. He acts. Nobody believes this stuff. They can work. Edge can talk, but they're they're having these guys go out and do movie scenes, not wrestling promos. It's it, it, it's it's a the theater in the round presentation where he is sitting there in the subdued lighting, emoting about all this stuff that everybody knows is complete bullshit. Because when they showed it on television, there were so many holes you could drive a fucking eighteen wheeler through it in terms of logic and credibility. So there's nothing about these interviews that are wrestling promos or even presented as a sports show. There's no interviewer. There's no sports announcer hosting the show, interviewing some of the athletes. It's actors doing scenes. And the camera even cut to sinister reactions by Seth Rollins in the back when Edge, the babyface, in the ring says something. Yeah, the monitor's to it's, his it's, left it's, and he's facing the other direction yes, altogether. Except he's not he's not looking. He's he's doing the fucking mm, face at the camera while the monitor is to the left of him showing it's God damn it. So this is it's worthless. They're making their main event talent worthless here because it's just bad acting instead of good wrestling. 
And it's not even their fault, Edge and Rollins. They're being made to do this. I can understand if they just sucked, but they're being made to suck because this is what Vince McMahon and or whoever the fuck he's got working for him these days think wrestling is. Anyway, that was the first segment. Do you have any thoughts? Just the atmosphere and the setup and everything with this Edge segment, it just... it. It's like right out of the Winter Garden Theater. You know, it's 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 less wrestling than theater. It's Broadway. It's we, I'm we gonna sit here that. and I'm gonna give a speech and the spotlight is on me and and then we go back to Seth Rollins acting like a child just acting like a Nickelodeon villain. This is so bad. This sucks. What a waste we, of it. We edge. would say down here we'd say Derby Dinner Playhouse instead of the Winter Garden. And the other thing I've noticed lately on SmackDown, especially on this episode, do they have to replay everything? I know replays are good. Replays are really important. It seems like they're replaying everything all the time to the point I don't want to see any of it anymore. Well, that's what helps make the entrances last 10 minutes. Yeah. It's when a guy takes three minutes to come to the ring, then they play four minutes of tape, and then they come back on the other side, and he wanders around for three more minutes. Well, we could talk it's... about Seth's promo in a little bit, but yeah, you're you're completely right. So... The first match on the program was Finn Balor against Sami Zayn. And I thought, you know, I bet this would be a real good match on a wrestling program. But since it's on this show and I don't really care. And also we know who's going to win because it's not like Sami's going to fucking Saudi Arabia. Um, but did you see the finish of this match? What the fuck? They are doing everything they can to run Zane and Steen off uh, together because the finish, Balor's not only going to beat him flat in the middle with the double foot stomp off the top, but his feet slipped off and he ass dropped Zane right in the stomach, full force coming off the top rope. Did you see that? I did not. I was zipping along, even, oh though, I was, even though I was watching it live. <laughs> I mean, well, let's say part of the magic of the double foot stomp off the top rope is you don't really cave the motherfucker's intestines in and give him internal injuries. But in this case, the feet didn't do it, but the ass might have because his when his feet slipped off, the ass didn't go on the other side. <laughs> it went straight into Zane. So there you go. Um, I'm going to come back. I'm going to skip ahead because I'm going to come back to the package they did on Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar, etc. But the next thing was an impromptu handicap match. Apparently, Naomi, now on her, on her own without the Flying Burrito Brothers, was going to wrestle Shayna Baszler, but Sonya Deville, who is the authority figure, with Adam Pearce, who I thought she was supposed to be in charge of the women and Pearce was going to be in charge of the men when they first started the thing. And then now they're both together on everything. And now Sonya Deville is just full-fledged heel and she don't like Naomi for whatever reason. We don't care. But basically in this one, Sonya Deville just joined Shayna Baszler and they just both kick the shit out of Naomi. And then Shayna beats her and the fucking referee counts it. Is this not why that they're in this spot right now with AEW and Tony Khan and why this is even remotely a contest is because for the last 20 years, the WWE has presented themselves as a heel promotion and the people in charge of things are the heels that are wanting to fuck all your favorite wrestlers and the people have taken this to heart and believe it in all ways. And that's why they're so anxious for anybody to fucking put Vince out of business and fucking are cheering along AEW because they might put the evil empire out of commission and then all our wrestlers can be happy and free to pursue a life of religious freedom. Because for 20 years, they have said the WWF administration is a bunch of fucking crooks. 
Vince worked. Mr. McMahon, that was great because he was a once-in-a-lifetime TV performer and he had Steve Austin on the other side. That's what made it work. Just that those two things right there. And once that that had run its course, then they should have gone back to the promotion is straight, the heels are crooked. Because then they wouldn't have made all these people, the last two generations of wrestling fans, grow up to hate the company. Because the only thing people really believe about wrestling anymore is that Vince and the WWE fuck all their favorite wrestlers. And the reason they believe it is not only they're really doing it behind the scenes, but they do it on TV too. So do you see any sense in this, Brian, is what I'm asking you. 20, what is it, 25, 24 years later, after Mr. McMahon, do we still need the promotion to be a heel? No. And WWE has been stuck doing a lot of things for a very long time that, you know, if you tuned away from that show and tuned back in five or six years later, they're doing the same garbage they've always been doing. The only wrestling promotion in the history of wrestling that's ever presented itself and or the people that own it as heels and or a few outlaw groups afterwards when Vince had success with it originally that have copied it. But otherwise than that, no, never. There's a reason for that. Anyway, this was rotten. Um, did you detect any unrottenness about it or can we move on? I haven't really understood why they're doing a Naomi <laughs> Sonya feud. And I really didn't care. Uh, they did a package on hit row. Are they, I thought it was death row. That's the other record label. Yeah, that's Suge Knight. Yes. Hit row. I can do without ever seeing or especially hearing them ever again. Because every time they show up, there's some goddamn rap music playing in the background, and they repeat all of their scripted catch. They speak in catchphrases. It is sentences of catchphrases from B Fab and Holler Holler and whatever the rest of them's name are. Seth Rollins came out and did the same thing Edge did, but probably actually not as well because he's not the actor. Edge has at least been in a few TV programs. But it was another long dinner theater audition, wasn't it? Go ahead, go off on this. I know you're waiting for it. When I first saw him starting to walk out and doing his goofy, silly walk, and he's wearing a silly outfit that even Boyd Pierce wouldn't wear. I mean, it's all so wacky <laughs> and just so fake because it's nothing like he's ever been. So all of a sudden, you know, he's not David Bowie. He's not known for recreating himself. This just seems off to me. So it takes him a while to get in there, so commercial break. I said, this is the point. Because I still got to watch as much of this dynamite shit, or not dynamite, rampage tonight <laughs> as possible. I'm going out on the deck. I'm going to go smoke a joint. Oh, God damn it. And then I'll come back and enjoy this show. I went out on the deck. I went downstairs. I smoked a joint. He was still fucking talking. He was still talking six minutes later, and then it wrapped up. after Six minutes after the commercial break. He was you still know, going. It's not, it's not fair also that the rest of us have to watch this with no pharmaceuticals. And you're 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 you have an unfair advantage. Come over, I got the best shit. That's that's what a cop said to me one time. And he pulled me over and gave me a speeding ticket for going 61 and a 55. I said, seriously? He said, Well, we saw that you had a radar detector. We consider that an unfair advantage. <laughs> I said, I got a $300 radar detector. You got $5,000 worth of radar. I consider that an unfair advantage. Didn't work. Good answer. Anyway, so then Carmella wrestled Zelina. After that, Happy Corbin and Madcap Moss sat in the... I swear, folks, I'm not lying about this. You know what happens to my feet when I lie. They fly, and my feet ain't left the ground. Happy Corbin and Madcap Moss sat in the ring and told bad jokes until Booger interrupted playing his guitar so Shaky Nakamura could have epileptic seizures to the ring, and they played all around the ring and then walked back to the stage without getting in the ring. And then the Street Profits came out, and they all danced while they dropped 
hundreds of plastic drinking cups from the ceiling on top of the baby faces. And I actually don't really understand what the fuck that was even there for. Your thoughts on Happy Corbin yeah, and know, Madcap Moss. Yeah, well, you kind of know what I think about all this stupidity and grown men acting like children. And it's just, you know, wrestling is such a weird thing because no one ever truly leaves it. No one ever walks away. Even if you say, I hate it, that's it. You're still talking about it. You're still thinking about it. You'll probably still watch it for at least a few minutes. Maybe leave it on in the background. But there's differences. You know, when you watch AEW, it's not perfect. And there's a lot of things that would bother the traditional wrestling fan. But there's something there that, eh, if I can only get into it, I can get into it. With WWE, it's like, you know, every year you get a little bit older and the MTV Video Music Awards relate to you a little bit less. <laughs> and that's what I feel like when I watch WWE. It's like with AEW, I feel like they, they really want to get anyone they can to watch it. They think they're doing fine. Whether they are or aren't, who knows? With WWE, I almost feel like I'm aging out of it. Because even though the demographics show that it's an older audience, that's not who they're presenting this for. This is awful. And it just feels so fake and so manufactured. And I, I just... I mean, they're, te they're, telling, they're telling lame jokes to each other, slapping each other on the knee. It was so bad. And the audience wasn't really going crazy for this. This audience that paid who knows what to go to a fucking wrestling show to watch a bunch of fucking speeches. <laughs> I love promos. What is this show? This show sucks. Should... Should they start with the demographic? Should it not be the age, but the IQ level, the intelligence quotient of the of the audience should be measured? It's not just for old people. It's for old, stupid people. Anyway. Almost like the CEO. <clears throat> the next, no, that would be old, demented. Say what you want about Vince. He's never been okay. stupid. You know what? Now that he's lost his mind... It's not his fault. He's 80. You've put me in my place. You're right. All right. Next match, tag team championship on the line in a street fight. The street profits against the Usos. So do I want to watch this because it's Roman Reigns' stooges that are presented as flunkies and gophers? Or do I want to watch it for the team that was just dancing in a rainstorm of plastic drinking cups? Oh, decisions, decisions. So I left it on in the background. I don't know what the fuck was going on, but the break spot, the Street Profits tried to pull a table out from under the ring, but the Usos at the same time dove through the ropes and hit the table and knocked the Street Profits down and wiped all four of them out. So their break spot was the baby faces trying to cheat and the heels doing cool moves to stop them. Did I get that about right? I think so. I was a bit distracted, too. I don't remember what time in the show this was, but somewhere around this point in time, I started watching Danielson versus Suzuki on the computer monitor while I was watching SmackDown on the TV. Oh, good Lord. Well, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, but anyway, they come back from the break. When they came back from the break, each one of the Usos had a kendo stick. Just wailing away on one of the street profits. Of course, it's a street fight, but they're doing it in front of the referee. Chairs, too, and they broke at least one table. And then the Usos beat them flat in the middle with a double frog splash, where both guys splashed, frog splashed the same guy. They didn't win by cheating like heels should do, because you can't cheat in a match like this. And... There's nothing better than green guys having garbage wrestling matches like they do every week on TV. Again, street fight, no DQ, lazy booking, whatever. The people weren't clamoring for a violent blow-off between these two teams. Closing thoughts on that? No. Okay. No thoughts on that. Then, the best match of the show. Becky Lynch versus Sasha Banks with Bianca Belair at ringside on color. And for the people who say, Cornette, Cornette, you never say anything good about the girls, and now you're saying it was the best match on the show, you are correct. 
And I'm saying that to illustrate how rotten the wrestling was on the rest of the show. Actually, I don't know if there was there was wrestling. It was Balor and, and Zayn, they wrestled. Just nobody cares. In this match, it was a good girls match. Very good. And the worst thing that I can say about this entire program is the best wrestling match on it was a 20-minute match between 230-pound girls. And Sasha won when Bianca Belair interfered and whipped her with her big old long ponytail. Before we go into the... Well, I'll, I'll say... The, before we go into the afterbirth, what'd you think of the match? And then what happened after the match um, we'll discuss. I thought it was a good match. Again, this was the overrun. This was the part that was directly commercial free against AEW with CM Punk, which was commercial free. But I thought it was a good match. And I think we said it last week or the week before. It's Reigns and Heyman and whoever they're dealing with. And it's been Sasha, Becky, Bianca. And their segments have been great. And I thought this was a really good match. And honestly and truthfully, if you'd asked me to place my money, well, this is why I don't bet. If you'd have said, Cornette, bet on which is going to be a better match, the one CM Punk is involved in or Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks, I would have lost some money. But unfortunately, that's the situation the WWE is in right now. A 20-minute girls match on a two-and-a-half-hour television program is the best match on the show. And then what happened right afterwards, because they were commercial free, I don't know whether this was a mix-up in communication or whether this was really fantastic impromptu acting. But all of a sudden, Adam Pierce shows up while <laughs> Becky is still sitting there, I think, absorbing her loss. One of the other girls is glorifying whatever. Um... Adam Pierce jumps up, go, go, leave, move, move, move. He's getting the stage hands in, get the chairs in, get the chairs in, set the table up quick, quick, quick. We got to do this. It looked just like what happens for real. And during a commercial break on a TV taping, when people they got three minutes to hustle out and get set up for the next segment, Except it was all on television, including you hearing Adam, get out, get out, get out. Just telling Becky Lynch, get out. So my question is, did they think they were going to a fucking pre-tape or something and they were doing what they normally do and hustling this shit in? Or did they do this on purpose exactly like they would do it off camera to illustrate that they're live and they're on camera? I'm not sure. It's a good question, though. <laughs> It's a good question. <laughs> because, I mean, I could see that somebody said, yeah, we're going to go to a pre-tape and you got to get in and you got a minute and a half to fucking get to in and out. Boom. I can see that happening and this being the result. But I don't know why that as anal as the WWE is about the way they dress and set their ring and for the celebrations, the contract signing, all of a sudden you would just see this one minute flurry of activity and, and the guy in charge screaming, quick, quick, get out, get out, get out. Yeah, would they have Pierce do that or someone else, actually? Well, if it if it wasn't supposed to be on TV, a variety of people would be doing it. But I can see him do, you doing it. But I, I couldn't understand what happened here, is all I'm saying. But anyway, then we came to the real main event. And earlier in the show, which I skipped over, there was a tremendous package. It was a long package, and it wasn't long enough. All about. Reigns versus Lesnar, but with the focus being where do Paul E's loyalties lie? Because this has been brilliant. Everybody was going to want to see Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar anyway. And as we mentioned a few months ago on the program, when we were picking a roster from the WWE talent, and what would what would you do with them? The money and the intrigue and the mystery around this whole thing is because Heyman's in the middle of it. And you can believe that Heyman is a shyster and a criminal and a crook and a con man that will play both sides against the middle and what's going to happen to him and whose side is he going to be on and what's going to be fit. This is, this is the way you sell something because 
they know that Brock and Reigns are going to have a match. And they, they, people can probably, if they've watched enough matches of theirs, they can probably figure what it's going to look like. But they don't know what's going to happen because Paulie's the wild card. And the only thing really interesting on this program to me is this deal because these are the only guys good enough to overcome the fake verbiage scripting, the ridiculous synthetic show business presentation on everything else. And you can kind of actually sit back and go, you know what? There's a lot of real in each one of those guys, the way that they would act. You can lose yourself in it because they're good enough. They're the only ones. So that was how they set up this contract signing. Whose side is the wise man going to be on? And after everybody got the bums rush out of the ring and they got everything set up, they have Reigns and Paul come out first, which I thought even though he's the champion, that's good because you want to see them. The announcers can fill it in. Reigns has been the champion for 411 days. Brock, the last time he was champion, was over 500 days. That's how you establish a world champion. And they gave those figures and statistics. And then... Of course, Brock sits there with a big smile on his face, puts his feet up on the fucking desk. He looks like Klondike Lesnar. Klondike Bill could fucking sue for gimmick infringement. But he's sitting there smiling, and Reigns has Paul look at the contract. Paul says, yes, my tribal chief, it's all you asked for. I counsel you to sign this. And he does, and then Brock just grabs the thing and signs all over the page, didn't even look at a line, which McAfee mentioned. And Reigns said, well, you dumbass farmer. You signed that without even reading it. And and we all know that the longer Lesnar talks, the bigger a hole he's going to dig. He's good in short spurts, and he's got that kind of whiny voice. That's the only thing he doesn't, it, the voice doesn't match everything else. But he said, I read it this morning with my advocate, Paul Heyman. And gets up and walks out. It's better than a fight. Everybody fights at the contract signings. But now he's walked out fucking laughing and Reigns is looking sideways at Heyman like, wait a minute, what's going on around here? We still don't know. That's perfect. Let's talk about the problem. They built this up great. I can't wait to see this match. I can't wait to see what happens. Wouldn't it be great if Heyman turns on both of them and shows up with Rex Steiner? (laughs) <laughs> I can't wait to see what it is. Biggest match of the year, they kept calling it, which will be Thursday at noon. Thursday at noon Eastern, <laughs> 9 a.m. Pacific. <laughs> they kept saying, all oh, show, the biggest match of the year, Thursday at noon <laughs> on Peacock. <laughs> but have, well, so what day, I don't, not even time, but what day is it over in Saudi Arabia? Did they pick a Wednesday night or a Thursday night or whatever? Why can't they do it on Saturday? What are they, a bunch of uncivilized people over there? <laughs> I think for the money they're paying, they're going to pick exactly when and how they do well, the show I mean, and they, who they gets get to a, leave the country and who doesn't. They get a big giant stadium full of people. It can't be Thursday at noon their time. I'm stunned that Goldberg and Heyman go there, to be quite honest with you. I wouldn't go there. I can't believe they go there. I can't believe anybody goes there. And I, you know, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised at, you know, Paul E going where anybody will pay him to go, but Goldberg's got probably more money than the federal government. But, uh, you know, I can't imagine going to Saudi Arabia to go to on vacation. But anyway, um, this is a long television program to watch for 10 minutes of Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. And the girls match. Well, now you got me calling them girls. And the women's match was good. Well, it, the, the women's match was good since I was there, but I wouldn't have got, made the trip to see it. You wouldn't have made the trip to see it, but you recognize that the women involved in the match are as over as anyone on that show, with the exception of Reigns and Lesnar. I agree with that. And that's part of their big problem. And the Seth Rollins stuff is just atrocious. And Edge sitting there in the ring with the, with the fucking... In the chair doing his speech, trying to sell us about how angry he is about this guy coming to his house where him and his wife and kids live. Was this from the Cody Rhodes acting school? Where, where did they teach this course that you learned how to do this? 
the this is no exaggeration or no joke, and I will move on from this program. It wasn't worth talking about this long. But the writers on the writing team are convinced that they are writing television shows with actors. And the dreck that they produce is proof of that. And it's not going to change. Now, over on the other channel, they let the wrestlers, plural, all of them, do almost anything they want to do. And probably nothing's going to change there either. So you've got some really crappy shit on both sides for two diametrically opposed reasons. One is don't have people telling the wrestlers what to do that don't even realize that it's wrestling. And on the other side, don't let the wrestlers tell you what they're going to do because they got a bunch of stupid ideas too. You need to have people experienced in wrestling telling the wrestlers what to do within the context of the wrestling business. Then you got it. But there is neither on either of these companies. There is neither of these companies addressing that basic principle. They're swinging and missing from, from both sides and not going straight down the middle. Anyway, that's what I had to say about that program. I'll tell you what. It just made me think, you know, if I was ever to be caught in SmackDown, I would want to jump in my car and drive as far away as quickly as possible. Then I would realize I'd have to get my window fixed first. And you know, <laughs> that's right. Because just like when I had to drive back from Atlantic City that night, when they broke my back wind out of my Ford Taurus and going across the George Washington Bridge, all the glass that would fall and clinker and clinker and the uh, back seat and everything that was a very fun trip but wait, anyway wait a minute what you went across the george washington bridge coming up from atlantic city to go back to connecticut yeah i think i did it was a big old bridge i believe it was the george washington oh, I, well i guess if you're going through the city up yeah i guess maybe you're going to connecticut that way i guess you could have interesting all right. all right goddamn randy mcnally you're you're throwing off my goddamn pitch here the point is, if you, if you, ladies and gentlemen, are stuck in need of a piece of your car that you need to replace, whether it's a window or a crankshaft or a framostat or a doofus or whatever those fancy damn names are for car parts, well, you need to go right to the people at rockauto.com. You've seen the commercials. You've heard the praises. You've heard the, the jingle. All the parts your car will ever need, Rock Auto. Now experience the greatness. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you are foolhardy enough to attempt to repair your own vehicle, something that I would never do because I I only know how to put the gas in. Everything else is up for debate. But is, isn't he an AEW foolhardy? Foolhardy, he is there. He's one of the AEW. Uh, uh, it's the House of Hardy. But anyway, if you know how to fix your car. And all those fancy damn things that that uh, you need to do to do that, you need to get the parts at RockAuto.com. There's an ever increasing number of makes and models. It's impossible for these traditional chain storefronts to stock all the parts that you need. And so, why are you going to go in these places and you're going to go through all this intimidating and pointless and endless questioning? What model? What make? He's going to order something that's going to take five or six weeks to get in, or he's going to pick the only brand that his warehouse happens to carry. You, virtue of the access you have to your computer, folks, can go to rockauto.com and you can get any part your car will ever need because the chain stores can only stock as much as they can, but they can't stock everything. And also, if they've got different prices, it's a gimmick. If you're a professional mechanic, you got the secret knock and you get in you get a discount but if you're just a do-it-yourself schlub trying to fix your old beetle then they're gonna screw you they're gonna nail you to the wall they're gonna waltz you across texas and give you your comeback to the locker room so what you need to do is go to a family business that's been serving auto parts customers for 20 years like rockauto.com 
hundreds of manufacturers, engine control modules and brake parts to tail lamps, motor oil, new carpeting, blinker fluid, all that stuff. The catalog is unique, easy to navigate. You can see all the parts available. Choose the brand specifications and prices you prefer. And if you go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available, if you'll just do us a favor and write JCE in their How Did You Hear About Us box, they'll know we sent you and we'll all be happy. Will they give you a discount? Fuck no, they won't. You know why? Because everybody gets a discount with their remarkably everyday low prices. They can't mark this stuff down any further. If they did, they'd have to pay you to take it. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. And they even got window lifters. That'll be good for you. What's good for you this week? Over there at the Arcadian Vanguard Network. It's like five to seven minutes of action, but it takes hours and hours on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter, at Super Podcast, or on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. It's been a show that a lot of people have been waiting for. The latest episode of the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review Podcast with myself and Mike Mills reviewing Mid-South Wrestling Television from November 26, 1983 the debut of Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express. Also the debut of The Barbarian. Also the return of Ted DiBiase. Also a tease of the macho man, Randy Savage. All of that and so much more. I don't know if you've heard about it, but Bill Watts hates Russians. Here and today (laughs) at MidSouthPod.com or search for the MidSouth Wrestling Television Review wherever you find your favorite podcast. Also, I want to make a little bit of an announcement right now. I'm very happy to say that Mike Sempervivi, of course, the host of the Mid-Atlantic Championship podcast, has taken on an expanded role with Arcadian Vanguard. More announcements and more news to come, but we are working right now on a very exciting project that I'm very, very excited to reveal to everyone in the future, but I want to announce that... That's why it's so exciting. I want to announce that Mike is now on the team for an expanded role, so you'll be hearing more about that. And of course... The 605 Super Podcast... The Mothership! You sound excited. I'm excited. Here are the latest episode right now. War and Peace, The Wimp, The Blimp, and The Wig. Everyone's listening to it. Find out why. Here Brian Solomon. Here Howard Baum on Burt Prentice, a story referenced earlier. And so much more. 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcast. And the next episode is in production right now. The Mothership! (laughs) All the shows your ears will ever need, Arcadian Vanguard. Mothership! Mothership. (laughs) All right. Before we talk about the AEW Rampage event, can you explain to me, Brian, how you have a buy-in for a free show, and what's more, why the buy-in show on youtube should affect the numbers on television i can understand why you want to put something to run against wwe considering they're doing that to you for the next half hour that part makes sense i can understand the idea of a buy-in or a pay-per-view preview show for a pay-per-view event taking place either on that same channel or feed where you could order it or something that's not I have to go watch the TV or something, something that's a click away. Calling it the buy-in and doing a loaded show into the free television show was definitely an interesting move. I, you know, I, I wouldn't have done it maybe the way they've done it, but again, we're right now at a period of time where WWE is passive-aggressively treating this war with AEW like it's nothing going on, and AEW is starting to respond. Whether it makes sense or not, AEW is responding. They wanted to do a rating on television that would compete with SmackDown on a lesser channel than normal, so they've got a shot at it. So they put Brian Danielson on YouTube and put the bunny on the TV show. Now, you're not wrong about that at all. And I wasn't as crazy about the Danielson-Suzuki match as a lot of other people seem to be. We'll talk about that in a moment. Well, yeah. Somebody was crazy about it? But clearly... 
it would have been a better fit for a star of Brian Danielson's power to be on that show instead of in front of a hundred thousand people watching on YouTube. Well, and the thing, and now a lot of people, are and that was say the number I, when I was there, it was a hundred thousand was, I think the that's, number, I so. was going to make mention of that. Some people are going to say, well, it's had 500,000 views as of the time that we're recording this. Yeah, but not all against SmackDown. They watched it later, which nullified the point of the whole thing. So, oh, Brian Danielson's wrestling Minoru Suzuki on YouTube. As soon as we finish with SmackDown and Rampage, then we'll go back and watch that. Because it can be seen anytime. If they'd have put it on Rampage, hey, we better watch Rampage because Brian Danielson's on there. We won't be able to see that show wherever else we see it for fucking however many days. Blah, blah, blah. I don't, it, let's talk about who went crazy for that match. I saw some people on social media say that they thought it was a great match, specifically saying, I hope you guys review this match because it was so great. And I was biting my tongue, figuring I should just wait until we record to talk about my thoughts about the match. Okay, well, I tried. Because I like Brian Danielson. I respect Minoru Suzuki as a mixed martial arts legend. But as we've mentioned in the past, unless you know of his background, then you look at him like a small, unimpressive elderly Japanese fellow, and if you know of his background and have the respect for him, then that helps you look over the fact that he's 50-something years old and his shit looks like shit. But still, you can't tell me that anything about this was good. I saw the same thing over and over. Standing there hitting each other with forearms yep. that don't look particularly good and probably hurt. And not just doing the one, two, one, two, like a Rocky movie, like Jerry Lawler and Dutch Mantell in the Memphis mid South Coliseum, whanging each other with the punches and the blood flying and the rubber legs and the body language standing there in the middle of the ring. Calmly. I'll grab the back of your head. You know, it's coming. You're not trying to duck. I'll hit you with a flipper forearm. Now you do the same to me. Now we'll have funny facial expressions and dare each other to do it again. Here in a minute, we'll do the same thing with kicks. Then we'll wrestle around for a little bit in simulated wrestling combat that everybody can see through because nobody wants to hurt Suzuki because he's a legend and a badass. And so everybody's going to be ginger with him. And he ain't going to hurt anybody else because he's 50 something and he don't want to hurt anybody. So they're just, and then they stand up and they start trading forearms again on purpose, watching each other do it, daring each other to do it at a snail's pace. And I would fast forward two, three minutes and they'd be doing the same thing. And I'd go again and they'd be doing the same thing. And I'd be going again and they'd do the same thing. It's the same thing over and over with Suzuki and anybody that wants to work with Suzuki or anybody who wants to work like Suzuki. They've all got their fucking minds in Japan and they can't fucking get out. It was like, Brian Hildebrand said to me one time, he was over at the Smoky Mountain Flophouse one time with Casey O'Connor, Chris Jericho, um, the Infernos, <clears throat> whoever else was there at the time. And he came back and he said, they won't stop watching Japanese wrestling. No wonder they can't get it because that's what they would do. They would on their off time, they were watching Japanese tapes. And that's why finally Lance, I don't know whether Chris ever got it or not, or admitted that he got it. But Lance finally said, we finally started learning to have the match. The people wanted and not the match that we wanted, which didn't have anything to do in Knoxville, Tennessee with Japanese wrestling. Now these guys are so mu so such marks for this bullshit, strong style, Japanese, whatever the fuck, that they're going to do this. They're either playing Japanese wrestling when they're doing it amongst themselves, or they're getting a chubby over Japanese wrestling when they're getting to do it with a Japanese guy. But the point is, this is ridiculous. It looks phony. It's not exciting. And they're not going to increase their audience by having 
their biggest mainstream name star now, Brian Danielson, except for CM Punk, going 15 minutes in a phony-looking match with a 50-something-year-old Japanese guy that nobody besides their core audience is even going to recognize in a police lineup. Your thoughts? I've been a fan of Suzuki in the past, and I certainly respect who he is, not just in MMA, but even in professional wrestling. You know, he's been doing stuff with New Japan pretty regularly now for several years. And I like Danielson traditionally, although I'm seeing a lot more of this from him. Just, I've been ranting about how much I hate guys trading spots in the middle of the ring, especially the match has been happening for 20 minutes, and now we're going to slow things down and trade spots. Yeah, now we're going to bring everything to a screeching halt could kill all the momentum and stand there and do more phony shit that nobody would actually do. I'm not crazy about that. This match was nothing but that. And I understand there are fans that are into it. There are fans that get into the moment. There are fans that, you know, that Samoa Joe, Kenta Kabashi match. It's technically not a great match. It's just chops nonstop. But they were still at least hitting each other harder. Oh, than, they were hitting each other hard. And the room was into it. And these guys were. And the room was into it. And maybe someone will tell me the room was really into this. But I thought this was really bad. And it seemed endless. No, you could see the room was really into it. But that's the problem is everybody that's into it is in that room. It, it, you're not going to. The WWE is presenting lackluster matches with guys that aren't over, and so now's the time for somebody to do something, and instead, they're making their top stars do phony-looking, bad-looking bullshit because their base audience is is going to like anything, and they like that kind of stuff, but show the average wrestling fan that, and they're like, well, what are these two stupid idiots just standing there punching each other for? Not even punching. Forearming. On purpose. Waiting for it. Daring them to do it. Hit me again. Fuck you. How about hit me, and when you try to, I duck and knock you out because you were stupid enough to think I was going to stand here and let you hit me. So anyway, that I don't know what traffic, if any, that that brought to Rampage, but that sure didn't do Brian Danielson any favors. I did not like that match at all, and I was prepared to. I wanted to like that match. And it was and just he, nonstop trading blows, and it's boring. I'm sorry. It's fuck. Maybe if you're in the room, it's exciting, but it was boring to me. Even, even if it's exciting for you to see two people in person that you've never seen in person before, and you're there in the arena, and oh, golly. Why is it exciting when the shit doesn't look good? Why is it exciting when the shit's obviously phony? That's, I, I don't, so anyway. Whatever viewers they led to the program, the program opened, and you could tell that uh, Tony was salivating. They blew off the pyro. Excrement said, it's Friday night, and then all of a sudden, like Mussolini! And Bruiser Brody, they didn't wait. They got right to it. Here's the music. Here's the people. It's clobbering time. Remember what we discussed last week? Because last week it was Punk and Garcia, right? This is getting normal. It's getting normal. The the Two months ago, people didn't know whether they were ever going to see CM Punk in a wrestling ring again. And two months later, we're seeing him in cold matches against mid-card guys every week on free TV. There wasn't anything wrong with this as a match, but it's getting normal. And that's the last thing they need to happen. A win or two to show the people he still had it, Thing with Darby was good. Thing with Hobbs was good. Garcia worked because he had two heel stooges at ringside to help get the heat. And it's a heel he's working with and blah, blah, blah. He made it plausible. But a lot of people may be going to say, well, you said MJF ought to have wins every week for the first three months on TV. Yes. You give a guy repeated wins to get him over. If he comes in as over as he's ever going to be, the reverse is true. 
then you keep it special. Even if it's always good, it's not always good for you. Punk has a good way, especially at the start of this match, of putting a lesser guy's shit over and then showing that he was surprised by it, but he can deal with it now that he knows that it's going on. Right? You know what I'm saying? Kind of like, oh, wow, the kid's firing up here. That kind of attitude. Jerry Lawler could do it as a heel on his TV matches. They just, when he was a heel, they just give him 10 minutes on Memphis TV every Saturday morning. Whoever it was with, he would have a good match. He'd have a competitive match, but the attention would always be on him. The focus always on him. He would keep it about him. Even when he was, when he was getting the shit kicked out of him, you were still watching him. And he was always in control. He had that vibe. With Punk, he can do that very well with his body language and his facials, but it's harder when you're doing it as a babyface because you can't be cocky and condescending and turn into a heel. But he did it a little bit early here. And then, you know, Matt Seidel's a good talent. He had the the horrible debut where he fucking tried to do that thing off the top in that battle royal and just crashed and burned and it was so embarrassing he's a good talent he's a good worker he's painfully small but he's good and he's in shape but he's been presented as a middle card guy and so under again as this went on punk was trying to have a good match with matt sidell and show everything that matt sidell can do but it ended up giving him too much. And with commercial free, they had 20 solid minutes, including the entrances. So Punk couldn't kick the shit out of Matt Seidel that whole way. Seidel had to have some offense. Seidel's a baby face, so Punk couldn't, like I said, use the heel stooges and interference like with Garcia. So he did what he could by having a good match, but booking CM Punk to wrestle a, a mid-card babyface for 15 minutes bell to bell on TV this early in his run and this competitively was a mistake. They're fucking with the golden goose. <clears throat> and honestly, I said last week, well, they, they've obviously put Punk against Garcia for the ratings and some smart ass on Twitter was kind enough to chime in. Well, it didn't work because the ratings still went down. I said, well, they're trying. I didn't say they were succeeding. That was what that was about, Punk versus Garcia, and that's what this is about. CM Punk wrestling on television should do ratings, but you can't just have CM Punk versus Tits McGee. One time you can, because then they, you know, the first time they were like, oh shit, Punk's back. We didn't know this was going to happen. His first match. Anybody will watch. Doesn't get, it, it doesn't matter who it is. But then after that, now they know he's around. Now they want to see him involved in something. Now they want to see him against a top guy. He's shaking off the ring rust. Now people can see through this. Well, you know, I get to see CM Punk wrestle on television, but I don't know that I've ever wanted to beat the doors down to see CM Punk wrestle Matt Seidel. So I guess I can miss this because we know he'll probably be back next week. That's the way that fans get. And so at that point, you know, I just, they're, they're fucking with the golden goose and they're getting diminishing returns because it's too normal and it's happening too often. They had a good match, but it was way, it was not only just competitive, it was, Seidel was ahead. I mean, you know, it, at one point I thought maybe Matt Seidel can pull this off, which is the wrong thought to have at this stage of the game when you've got a a, a money-drawn attraction that you're trying to take care of. Uh, there was a couple of spots I liked. They both fought on the top rope and then both punched each other and took a double bump to the floor at the same time. Why haven't we seen that before? That actually makes sense. Um... Punk gave Seidel a scoop slam on the apron, which if you have to do something on the apron, that's the safest thing I've ever seen anybody give somebody on the apron. 
these reverse hurricane Rana's and death Valley drivers, just to slam, you know, exactly where you're putting him. But as I said, you know, finally, at one point, the people were chanting GTS, go to sleep, go to sleep. I was about to. And then finally, Punk hit the go to sleep out of nowhere. One, two, three. And the summation of this whole thing, and I'll let you give your thoughts, but Excalibur summed the whole thing up. As soon as that one, two, three happened, Excalibur's exact quote was, CM Punk just barely defeated Matt Seidel when it should have been. Matt Seidel gave it everything he had, but it just wasn't enough to beat CM Punk. But they don't know who they're trying to get over or how to do it. Your thoughts? I think you're right. And that's not to say it wasn't a good match, but it wasn't the right match. And I had the same thought as you, and I'm loving Punk's return like you are. It's too much. I liked the Daniel Garcia match. I didn't have a problem with it. When all of a sudden he's again on a Friday night, not even on Dynamite, on Friday night, competitive with Matt Seidel, nothing against Matt Seidel, except that YZ is competitive against CM Punk right now <laughs> at this point in both of their careers. Didn't make much sense. You know, if you put CM Punk on there against someone and don't have a competitive match, which may not be what he wants. Maybe he only wants to have competitive matches. But if you have him go on there and beat someone in five minutes, hit the GTS, the fans there were going nuts for him. Nuts. And at one point, they were ready for the finish, and they went a little longer, and then they still popped big for the finish. If he had gone five minutes, they would have loved it, get a promo in there, and then get right to Danielson, and there's your half hour against SmackDown. Yeah. But instead, we got a really long punk match, and I liked the match. Nothing against the match, except that it was wrong. But it was a the good point, match otherwise. The point of a match involving CM Punk and AEW at this stage of the game Yes, there's an element of we need, you know, to try for ratings with the big guns. But at this point, it should be to make an, a, a middle card heel look better than he ever has, Powerhouse Hobbs. Or even a, a baby face that really has some oomph and some following, like Darby Allen. Okay. But when we go to Garcia, when we go to Seidel, now it's just to have Punk on television for ratings if he if he draws him in that position and it, 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 that shouldn't be what it is like i said either either make cm punk look good or get him into an angle or an issue or a, a position something with some other semi top talent that's what you should be using punk for at this point but not to elevate middle card guys and just try to plummet for ratings. It's just not you know, anyway. So why haven't we gotten him and Ricky Starks? I mean, it was him and Team Taz, and then it led to him and Hobbs. We never got him and Starks. Well, but also the thing is, some of these things have to be saved. If you think that that may, might be a place that you go and stay there and visit and and you know work that deal for all the you know uh, uh, Punk and Starks, Punk and this guy, Punk and that guy. Maybe they think it's too soon. But they're going to take the bloom off of it if they have punk and so and so and punk and this guy and punk and that guy and punk and, and punk and everybody. Then it's not going to be special anymore by the time they get there. I can understand wanting to put Seidel before Starks if you're trying to elevate the opponent. But if you're trying to slowly escalate yourself for opponents from bottom to top, he started with Darby. Went to Hobbs. Now he's Garcia and Seidel. We're, we're going the wrong way. You know what he's going to be for Halloween? What? Pumpkinhead. <sighs> so it was good to see that the Dork Order is all back together and friendly again. They're not fighting anymore. The Dork Order, a.k.a. Nine Wasted Paychecks. Have you noticed that Cole Cabana is standing so far back in the back of that group to avoid being noticed? It looks like he's doing the thing where <laughs> he's backing slowly out the door while facing forward. <laughs> you can't tell he's leaving. It does seem like that, yeah. It's. I mean, he looks. He like was the biggest star of all of them before this. I mean, he's the biggest name of the bunch when he started. I'm not saying he's the biggest star of all time or anything, but he had a fan following. He had a podcast. He was 
doing shows all around the world for years. Again, smaller shows. He had a little bit of a run in WWE. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't wrestle. He just stands in the back while all these guys do their shtick. And he looks so tiny all the way back there. But he's he's collecting the check and saving the wear and tear on his body and hoping that Punk doesn't notice that he's still there. So he asked Tony to fire him. You know, let me just quickly ask, because we do get questions, and let me get it out of the way here. We do get questions in a drive through asking, shouldn't Tony do Punk and Cabana? Isn't that the big money what? feud? Are you fucking ribbing? I'm not ribbing. I'm telling you, these are the questions coming in. I don't think that they're logical, but what do you think? Number one, it, I would think in that case, it doesn't really matter what Tony Khan wants to do or not do. He can get mad or get glad or get over it because I would assume that Punk, since he has excommunicated Cabana from his life for reasons that we do not know as of yet, but must have been pretty juicy, um, they went from best friends and bosom buddies to over that by the time the lawsuit was finished to suing each other. CM Punk doesn't have to work if he told if he told Triple H I don't have to work with you you have to work with me you think he's gonna fuck his oh well shit I gotta work with C with Colt Cabana now because Tony Khan says so. Secondly, are you out of your fucking ever loving mind? Colt Cabana was a darling on the independent scene and has a ton of people that just loved him to death when they would go visit him in a rec center somewhere for. Ian Rotten or whatever, but Punk's a real star. And no, that wouldn't be a big money match. It'd be the same thing we're talking about. Instead of CM Punk versus Matt Seidel, people be going, CM Punk versus Colt Cabana? Fuck. That need to be competitive for 10 minutes? Because Again, these independent guys that lived in their independent bubble that assumed that they were all over like God and Rover because their small crowds in their indie shows cheered for all their goofy bullshit and comedy. They're in the big leagues now on national television. And Colt Cabana is nobody compared to CM Punk on a mainstream basis. And that would not draw any money because the only people that would know why in the world it was even taking place are already in the building. They're all the smart marks that live their life on the goddamn internet and love this shit to begin with. It wouldn't draw a single new fan. They, I'm telling you, and I've been here with Ring of Honor. AEW is in a position where the more that they try to bring in mainstream talent and the more they try to really make moves to have decent matches and programs that get people over and point to fucking top matches the more problem they're going to have from their little club of private fans that don't want anything to change and want 45 million Lucha Brothers gymnastics matches with special referee Olga Corbett because that's all they like about wrestling. And there's not enough of them to fucking, as Ring of Honor showed. But you, you remember when Ring of Honor had the opportunity to go on television bring in name stars, change to a more appealing product from a mainstream standpoint for multitudes of wrestling fans instead of just the goddamn people that have no other life but to follow this incessantly. They were mad that their private club had been infringed on and they wanted all their flippy-doo Jack Evans's back. This was the crowd that said the Super Smash Brothers were the greatest tag team in wrestling. And trying to appeal just to those people has bankrupted every fucking company that's tried it. And poor Carrie Silken had to sell to Sinclair. Oh, poor so, Carrie Silken. Well, I'm just telling you. So he'll be all right. He's not hurting for fucking dinner this week. I wish he was. But, oh, come on. But, uh, but that's the point is that the, there's a civil war amongst the fans. If you try to make it a legitimate professional wrestling promotion with mainstream stars and good looking work and sensible shit instead of the gymnastics and the tomfoolery and the independent bullshit, their base audience will, at the same time as they're getting new people in on one side, their base audience will start cussing them on the other side because they don't want to see that because it makes too much sense for them. So that's where they're at. Anyway, the next match. 
was Ruby Soho versus the Bunny. <laughs> God damn it, they're trying to win this. SmackDown is on the other channel doing everything but running a test pattern to give AEW this victory, and they're putting Ruby Soho and the Bunny against SmackDown. So anyway, Ruby Soho won. Penelope Pitstop came out, got some heat on Ruby Soho, knocked her out with brass knuckles, while the adult male referee there acted as if he could do nothing to stop these 220-pound blonde airheads from committing mayhem. What'd you think of that? I thought it was nothing. Waste of TV time. And then... There was, I was all over the place on this main event. There is great shit in here. There's horrible shit. There's shit people should have been proud of. There is shit that people should have gone to jail for. All in the last 15 minutes of this show. The main event was Chris Jericho, Jake Hager, and and, um, Sammy Guevara against Scorpio Sky the other page and junior dos santos junior dos santos a former ufc heavyweight champion a world known and renowned sports figure made his professional wrestling debut on free tv in a six man tag team match at 10:45 on a friday night Let's that let's just let that sink in for a second. That would be like if fucking when Vince got Mike Tyson, if he hadn't refereed at WrestleMania instead, if he'd have done a guest managing spot on Raw. Noon on Thursday. On at noon, well, one of the weeks when it was preempted by the Westminster Dog Show. And they had to show it at Tuesday at four o'clock. <clears throat> I, I I well, what are they doing here? And and of course, once that people saw his work, they're going to say, well, Jim, what else would you have done with him? That's not the point. I would have drawn money with him is what I'd have done. You can't tell me that the, the best scenario that they could come up with to introduce Junior Dos Santos to professional wrestling, this was it. This was the most beneficial scenario for their company or for Junior Dos Santos or everybody involved. (laughs) And that you would let him go in the ring obviously incapable of working his strikes to the point where that he could carry himself as something you would want to see again. At least they could have stolen a pay-per-view. If he can't, if he's not going to be any better than this, they could have stolen a pay-per-view. That phrase is not used anymore. It used to be steal a house. Then it became steal a pay-per-view. Now, can't really steal anything. But when you had a guy like the Magnificent Zulu, or you had a guy that was a freak of nature of some respect, he was large in size, or he was a of athlete from another sport or some type of gimmick that you were going to put into a match. You would build him up for however many weeks on television, expose his strengths, hide his weaknesses. Don't let him do anything to where the people could see through him and then book the match that they got to pay to see. And they pay to see it and it's rotten and you beat the fucking gimmick, and you get rid of it, and you don't bring it back because it was rotten, but you've stolen a house off of it because they didn't know it was rotten until they'd already paid. Now, they can't ever steal a house or a pay-per-view off Junior Dos Santos because they already know he's rotten. And nobody thought to minimize his weaknesses by hiding them. The first thing that junior dos santos does when he tags in and gets into a wrestling ring is go toe to toe with chris jericho chris jericho throwing phony punches and junior dos santos throwing phony punches and then junior dos santos comes out on top jericho sells and collapses and goes and tags hager 
but it looked rotten. And then Dos Santos and Jake Hager get in, and they looked like they knew what they were doing because both of them have done real MMA until Junior Dos Santos tried to work his punches, and then it still didn't look good. In case anybody hasn't realized by now, the reason why wrestling became a work on a more industry-wide basis, whereas boxing works and fixed fights in boxing were limited to individual instances and certain promoters and certain contenders that were being built, it was a case-by-case basis. Most of boxing was still a shoot. Only some things with money on the line was a work. Wrestling evolved into being a work because wrestling is easier to work. You can't tell on a hold how bad the pain is or how hard or not a guy's cranking up. But when you're a fighter and you can throw knockout blows and everybody's seen them, but you can't work the strikes and you work the strikes, then people see through it. That's why wrestling was able to fully transfer into a work proposition, whereas boxing was still intermittent, case-by-case basis, and mostly on the bigger money fights or the fucking fake contenders they'd try to build. You couldn't work it all the time. People can see through it too easily. So the point is, This was not a good use of this. And and America's top team, Lambert, was at ringside. Jorge Mazdival, I can never pronounce that name. Uh, They were there. The people are hot at Lambert. He had more heat in Miami, where his hometown, probably because they know him personally. People were screaming, chanting, shut the fuck up, and et cetera. But uh, Sammy Guevara is really an exciting baby face. I thought he was the star of this match. Um, but even, you know, otherwise when, the, when the other page got on top of Jericho at one point, his punches were as bad as Dos Santos's and he's supposed to be trained, but all they do is just windmill anymore. The punches f- fucking flat fist punches in the area of a guy's head. And they think that the speed of the arm swinging will make up for the fact that nothing's making any contact. So either they think that looks good or they're just not trying anymore. But I've never seen guys in the business punch like I have the guys the last five years. They went through a break and they got some heat on Jericho. And he's selling and then suddenly he hits the other page with an enziguri and both of them sell it. And then Page just crawls over and tags Scorpio Sky and I swear to God, Jericho looked over his shoulder and saw the tag and immediately just stood up and fell forward and cold tagged Sammy Guevara. Yep. There was no effort, no effort to make it a hot tag, no effort to even roll to a neutral corner and try to pull himself up and let Sky come in because they had set up that Sammy was going to make a comeback starting with him on the apron and and he was going to fight his way into the ring. So instead of Jericho going to a neutral corner, waiting for Sky to close in on him, rolling past Sky, and then diving and making the tag, and Sky come in and doing the same thing, Jericho just stood up and fell forward and tagged Sammy. So Sammy made a wild-ass comeback with a bunch of shit, springboard, boom, boom, boom. He hit five or six great-looking things, and the people were up. And then he turns around without even going for a cover and tags Jericho back in. Never tried to to win anything, never tried for a cover. Tags Jericho back in, and then everybody else in the match actually left the ring, went to the floor, and just stood on the floor watching while Jericho finished Sammy's comeback on Scorpio Sky and hit his lion salt for a big false finish. So he went for the pin and upstaged Sammy's comeback. The guy that sold had the heat got on him so he could give the babyface a tag. Babyface comes in, hits six moves, tags that guy back in. He goes for the cover. He gets the big false finish. He upstages Sammy Guevara. And everybody had to 
stand there on the in in camera range on the floor staring at Jericho doing all the stuff until it was time for them to get back in the ring so they could all take bumps back to the floor. <laughs> they all got back in the ring, locked up and bumped back to the floor. And then Jake Hager and Junior Dos Santos get in a fight at ringside and the camera is on them. And they're taking forever to what we saw later on, obviously, they're going to both crash through a table. Boy, we've never seen that before on a wrestling program. Two guys crashing through a table. But they're taking forever to do this spot. And obviously, the producer has told the cameraman, told the director, hey, they're going to do the table thing. So the camera is on them fighting at ringside. And suddenly, the crowd made a a noise that sounded like they had just seen the second coming of Jesus Christ appear before them and broke into a holy shit chant. And we have no idea what they saw. And they never even replayed it because they were sitting there waiting for fucking Hager and Santos to go through that fucking table that we've seen a million times. Did you hear that giant monster pop? It was like a spaceship had just landed. The people, oh, shit! The announcers didn't call it because they were looking at their monitors. Nobody replayed it. I guess they didn't have a shot of it because they were waiting to see these two fucking geeks cra crash through the table. So anyway... Then they go back to the ring, and Scorpio Sky and Chris Jericho are the only ones in the ring. Everybody else has disappeared. Jericho gets the walls of Jericho. Paige Van Zant from the front row with the rest of American Top Team jumps up on the apron of the ring and draws the referee, old ref Aubrey. And here comes Jorge Matabadabade and hits Jericho with a knee lift, and Sky pins Jericho. So, boom, one, two, three. Another one of the MMA fighters interferes. Jericho gets beat. The bell is still ringing after the three count when all the heels immediately jump on Jericho, <laughs> including the rest of American top team that came from the front row. So now you've got, you got the other page. You got Scorpio Sky. You got Junior Dos Santos. You got Mazdaval, you got Paige Van Zandt, you got a couple more of the fighters, you got Dan Lambert. They're kicking the shit out of Jericho. They've invaded the, the AEW here, America's top team. These damn shoot fighters are going to kill us all. Nobody tries to stop them. There's no bell ringing. There's no referees running down. There's no security to stop Paige Van Zandt from coming over the railing. There's no help of any kind. The AEW wrestlers in the locker room, babyface and heel alike, they must be a gutless bunch because nobody is coming to help. And the heels are standing around glorifying in their heat and waving their arms instead of playing king of the hill. And then the show goes off the air when Santana and Ortiz with their faces painted like panda bears, their music plays and suddenly they come out and run off the aforementioned eight people that I mentioned, including two former UFC champions, and the MMA guys are the ones that just bailed out and didn't even fucking stay to take a punch. So Santana and Ortiz, top rope, Scorpio Sky and the other page or whatever the fuck, and save the day. Two guys ran off the entire America's top team. Can you imagine if they'd have done that same finish? And they'd have got their fucking hands up. And they'd have been accepting that victory. But then, Jericho is down because he just got knee lifted by the MMA guy. But Sammy Guevara, Jake Hager could come in and start telling the referee, hey, that guy, Porta Mazdavapapapa, he came in and get the people started. And the referee's asking the people, did he come in and do that? And America top team now is going, no, 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 we didn't. And get some things going. And then before the decision can be reversed, that's why that the heels who had already won the match and could leave and 
go have dinner. They want to fight because now they want to jump on these guys and stop the referee from hearing any more about this to where they might reverse the decision. So that's when they jump the baby faces. And the baby faces start fighting back, but there's two of them and there's eight of these guys. So now they've got Jericho down and they got Sammy down and they got Hager down. And first, ding, 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 ding. Here comes the rest of the referees. But there's eight heels. They're playing king of the hill. The referees can't even get up on the apron without getting knocked down. Here comes t-shirt security with security across their shirt and dressed in black and there's three or four of them maybe one or two gets through the ropes and one of those shoot fighters grabs them and chucks them like yesterday's garbage and the other ones get nailed off the apron and now you've got three or four referees trying to get up and you got three or four security guys trying to get up and they're getting knocked down here comes some underneath baby faces here's three or four of them they can't get in the ring one of them tries to get come in with a chair but that goddamn no good junior Dos Santos takes the chair away and throws it at him. And you've got some more bell ringing and the people are fucking screaming. And then you have two or three of your top main event baby faces come with equalizers like a bat or a chair or something for once it's called for. And when the fucking heels see that, they've done all the damage they want to do. They see three baseball bats coming at them with three main event guys behind them, and that's when they bail out. And the baby faces slide in the ring and cover up the baby faces that have been beaten and stand in front of them to protect them and let the heels on the floor get their heat and leave with a smile on their face. That's how you build the run-ins and the heat and etc. to build the emotion instead of just fucking, well, we'll do whatever we want to do and then walk around until two guys run us off. So again, the Friday night show traditionally, and this was no exception, starts out in the penthouse and finishes up in the outhouse. Your thoughts? The match was not for me. This feud sucks. This whole Lambert thing seems so minor league. He got some big stars, and boy, does it not seem like it to me. Other than Paige Van Zandt. I think she's been a breakout star in this whole thing. (laughs) She can get some heat. You can want to wait to see if she can ever get her ass kicked by a Thunder Rosa or something. She was standing there taking selfies with her cell phone while they're beating up the baby faces. See, in the the old days, you could book her against one of the guys, and they would want to see that guy kick the shit out of her. But now in today's pussy-ish era if you do have an inner gender match the girl would be kicking the shit out of the guy like i said she's been great dos santos wasn't impressive in there if you're going to do something with him there had to be a hundred different things you could have done that would have been better and made him look impressive and if you're going to do anything with him like you said you don't do it at the end of the show friday night but if you're going to if you're going to bury any program bury the jericho one because it'll always suck with dos santos imagine what Vince could have done with him and Brock. Imagine what you, it, it, not even Vince, but any, it, it, when Vince was in his right mind, I should say, but anybody with a mind toward a sports-based presentation. And I'm not talking about Jake Hager because he's, he's an MMA fighter just barely. And you can tell he's not the greatest worker in wrestling and, and he's, he doesn't have the greatest record in MMA fighting. But if you if you get a guy like Dos Santos, you bring him in, you put him in secret training and get him to to know the basics. And then you figure out how to teach him to implement his shoot fighting and the style that he uses in the in the UFC or in MMA in the wrestling ring. When I was in MLW working with Tom Lawler. Tom Lawler was trying to be a a pro wrestler. And as a pro wrestler, he was pretty good. He wasn't the best. But you know what he was the best at? He was the best shoot fighter in the MLW locker room. So why not be that? That's what I told him. I said, don't immediately lose what brought you success in another sport and then go try and master this like you're just starting from scratch. Transfer your mixed martial arts and shoot fighting tactics and training 
to how can you work it in a wrestling ring but still come off as a dangerous badass as a threat to anyone because they know you're real. So the last thing that you need to do is take a shoot fighter and try to teach him how to be doing hip tosses and flying head scissors. But you've got to put him not only you've not only not not you've not only got to give him the, the background and the training of the basics and the simple things, how to protect himself, how to take the bumps, how to protect his opponent. But you have to concentrate with a guy like that. He doesn't need to know how to put on the Indian death lock. Right. You need to concentrate on tra- when you're training a shoot fighter with training him how to transfer his shoot fighting skills to a worked competition in wrestling, but still look like a shoot fighter, just look like you're shooting against a wrestler. That's why they didn't want Brock Lesnar when he was at OVW do that shooting star press. I'm like, well, goddamn, it's impressive, but you know, does that does that tell me that you're a former UFC champion that you do the shooting star press? And then finally, the one time he ever botches it was at WrestleMania. And they told him, don't ever do it again because you'll break your fucking knees. And this is not what we hired you for. We hired you to be the beast and a shoot fighter, not a goddamn luchador. So anyway, that's what, with, with Dos Santos, and Dan Lambert's a great wrestling fan. And I'm assuming that he would have provided the location for some secret training so that you could have debuted Dos Santos not trying to be a pro wrestler, but knowing how to work MMA against another experienced and talented pro wrestler with some MMA background or some legitimate wrestling background where he kind of knew how to work the shit on the mat and don't have him do either punches or hip tosses or flying head scissors or pro wrestling shit that the people can see through. And again, that goes back to when I said earlier, if that's why wrestling became a work. Because when you're grappling and wrestling and applying holds, nobody but the people involved can tell how good that hold is on, how bad it hurts, or how hard it's being applied. That's why the in the early days of wrestling, in the teens and 20s, you, you didn't even have to have a smart referee. Sometimes the referee was in a promoter's pocket on a double cross, but the referee didn't need to be smart. Nobody need, you didn't have to because the two guys that were working controlled what was happening and nobody else was any the wiser. And then it all got out of hand. But that's what I would have done with Dos Santos. Otherwise, you know, why did they have him here? It was a, he's a bad pro wrestler on, you know, in a free TV match, the way they presented him. Instead of being a dangerous menace from another sport to some top wrestling superstar who's not going to know how to, compete against this guy on his familiar turf have a fucking ufc mma rules match with junior dos santos then you put the wrestler at a handicap you let dos santos do some shit that he does in his normal day job fighting and hopefully the fucking wrestler is good and experienced enough to sell it properly but you put the wrestler at a disadvantage and that way he has a hill he's got to climb, an obstacle he's got to overcome. Instead, you this was Junior Dos Santos in the ring with five wrestlers who were all more experienced than he was. Ah. And Jericho at this point is just embarrassing and shouldn't be in the ring. But Jim, before we wrap this up, I have apparently the fast national ratings. Now, these aren't Ooh. finalized numbers, and these are not the demographic breakdowns. These are not to be taken completely like gospel, but probably are going to end up being close is what you're saying. And again, if you are someone who cares about the key demo, this has nothing to do with that. This is just the overall number, according to but Nielsen. If you're, fast if you're just a person like me that wants to know who, who, what program are more people watching than the other one, and I don't care how old they are, and I said that I believed that SmackDown would prevail by around 150,000 viewers, what, what say Nielsen? Motherfucker. Uh, according to Nielsen's Fast Nationals, SmackDown on FS1 at 8 p.m., 793,000 viewers. 
And that is, wait a minute, that is about 250000 less than they did on on FS1 the last time they were on FS1. I believe so. I believe so. And SmackDown... So eight. now, wait a minute, that number again was 700... 793. Nine, 793. So that means that for me to be correct oh God. about my prediction that AEW had to do less than 643. What was the number, Brian Last? Rampage on TNT at 10 p.m. did 549,000 viewers. Hee-haw! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I had a little pad there. Obviously, the whole story isn't there in the Fast Nationals, but... Part of the question will be how much of a chunk of the WWE audience, if any, did AEW take? And are these numbers good considering the competition that night with the baseball? Well, not only with the competition with the baseball, but with SmackDown not being on Fox. I mean, because all these rotten SmackDown shows recently have still done 2 million people. So for it to do, you know, just just under 800,000, um... I say most of that was probably due to the switch of the of the network and some of it was the ball game and and Rampage didn't gain anything. Ramp is Rampage less than last week. Right or wrong? I, what was I, last week? Last week was 6 something, wasn't it? I think so. I think this is less than last week. So I they didn't get any extra people and the WWE lost some of theirs. So it's a lose-lose. There you have it. Well, we'll see what story comes out of the ratings in the next few days, but I believe that is everything related to this Friday night excitement that we just experienced yesterday. Well, boy, if you think this show is exciting, and if you do, you'd be one of the only ones. Wait till you see and hear what we have for you coming up on the drive through in just a few days. And I guess that's going to be uh, your last comment, Brian Last, is we'll see you then, right? We'll see you on the drive-thru. We'll see you on the drive-thru, because that's your show. That's right. I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. Folks, <laughs> until then, I don't know what we're doing here. Thank you. Fuck you. And we'll see you soon, everybody.